people talking about a slowdown in the economy, except the S&P sits at 4,100. I do think that there is a danger that tech can't continue to do the heavy lifting for the entire market here. Broadly speaking, businesses are anticipating a slowdown in the economy. All those lead indicators pointing to slowdown slash mild recession. I don't see how we escape it. I really do think that the, the data are going to have the Fed hiking further. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Let's get you to the weekend. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500 negative, a third of 1%. Big turnaround after the close yesterday and Amazon initially rallying hard, then rolling over. Some soft guidance around the cloud. We'll discuss that in just a moment. Tom, we need to wrap up the week and push ahead to the Federal Reserve and payrolls next week. Big week just around the corner. Big week around the corner and, you know, at center on May third, yes, but I'm going to center on the Monday. Monday is May 1, and the heart of the matter is, and you know this, folks, sell in May and go away, and a lot of people publishing now about next week, you're right, May 3rd on to Apple May 4th, and dare I say the full moon on May 5th. There's a lot to analyze here coming into next week. And the ECB somewhere. Somewhere in as well. There. I don't know what happened to the month of April. What happened <clears throat> to the month of April? It was cold. Gone. It Bang. cold. Just For like those that. of you here, I know there's heat wave in Spain and it, in Italy. It was cold. AC Milan? What about it? I mean, I, I think in May, I mean, that would I, be a that, good place I to can, be. I can tell you that that's happening. That's Tickets good. Tickets secured. That's good. We were going to do the top. Funding not quite secured. <laughs> <laughs> Working on the rounds. Tickets secured. But the point here is the weather here has been chilly. And, you know, like Amazon yesterday, there was a chill put on the, the verbiage of 4 p.m. It was not one. The numbers came out, Lisa. The stock initially really rallied, rallied quite hard by, I think, more than 10%, then rolled over, soft guidance around the cloud. The story of the week, though, hits and misses in tech across the board. Microsoft, great. Meta, great. Google, kind of mess, somewhere in between. What's Amazon? Amazon, with respect to the number, is great. With respect to the guidance, concerning, maybe. <clears throat> I mean, this, to me, really tells you a lot when you've got a 14 percentage point swing in the stock price after reporting earnings going up 12 percent and now, yeah. uh, at one point, down more than 2 percent. How much do we really glean from the sentiment, basically how whipsawed people are from the uncertainty of what's going to drive growth going forward? Is it cloud or is it uh, potentially greater margins right. and consumer sentiment? You're addicted to a big, big double-digit cloud growth. And Anna Agrana, who's arguably best in the world on this at Bloomberg Intelligence, makes clear, yes, you're going to see an ebbing of the cloud short term. That's how you get, Lisa, to your 14 percent uh, swing on Amazon. But where is cloud in 2024? Well, and it goes to this larger story we were talking about yesterday, John, which was that essentially businesses aren't spending as much. And we saw that in the Q1 GDP. There is a real retrenchment in business spending, including on technology, including on cloud uh, infrastructure. So is this an Amazon issue? Because we didn't see the same kind of issue with the Azure platform for Microsoft. Or is this something broader about business spending? Well, the broader question, I think, going into Q2, and we are in Q2, how much momentum do we have in this economy? I was going through the Southside research on economics yesterday. Overwhelmingly, this is the consensus right now. Bank of America, expect the momentum in the economy to continue to slow in 2Q. BNP Paribas, we continue to anticipate a res recession in the second half of 2023. Morgan Stanley, expect to see significant slowing in 2Q23. TK, that's the consensus right now yeah. amongst economists on Wall Street. And, and I would say, let me get it up here to get the dates right, John. I don't want to mislead people. We wouldn't want to do that on a Friday. FOMC Go yesterday shifted from a May 3rd meeting, where I think we've got a pretty good grasp of what's going on, to a complete debate and mystery over June 14th and then on through uh, the summer. I, I, I think it's fascinating. I, I think yesterday we saw that shift. Do you want the other side of the debate? City's Andrew Hollenhorst says this. After hiking 25 basis points next week, Fed officials will likely be revising up growth and core inflation forecasts in June. So that's the split right now. You've got pretty much everyone on one side somewhere in between. And then Andrew Hollenhorst saying, you know what, nothing's changed here. Fed's going to have to keep on, keep on hiking. They're going to be revising their forecasts higher when they meet in <coughs> June. Let's get to May 1st, pushing through April. Your equity market negative a third of 1% on the S&P 500. Just a little bit softer here. In the bond market, yields coming back in by four or five basis points. Your 10-year there, Tom, 3.47% on a 10-year. Yeah, I don't want to distract right now as we get the hour started with Phil Orlando. But, John, I'm going to note there's 
there's news in Japan. We'll cover it later, folks. What you need to know is a demonstrably weaker yen against the euro. It's just something to watch. It's tangential to a Friday debate, but it's there. Lisa, there's going to be a big policy review <coughs> at the BOJ. Yeah, is this dovish? Is this hawkish? We'll debate that probably for the year to come. Today, we do have ongoing earnings, although less than this full week. Now, we are now more than halfway through this earnings season. This morning, we get Exxon and Chevron before the market. This might give us a better sense of whether we're accelerating or slowing down in terms of economic growth based on what they say, based on oil demand. Also, the big question of China. How strong is that growth? 8.30 a.m., to me, this is the big data point. It's not personal income. It's not personal spending. It's not PCE deflator. It is the employment cost index, which comes out every quarter and is expected to reaccelerate after decelerating for uh, a couple of quarters. This is a big concern. This might really push the Fed's hand, and this is the reason why this actually could be the most market-moving kind of uh, figure that we see. And also today, this is going to be fascinating. At 11 a.m., the Fed is going to be releasing supposedly this review of what happened with Silicon Valley Bank, what happened with its oversight? Michael Barr, the vice chair for supervision uh, for the Federal Reserve, is leading this up. It was due by May 1st. How much does this change the conversation in terms of confidence, John? Because we've seen kind of a stability in terms of pricing of regional bank stocks, albeit no rebound. But do we get a better sense of confidence of whether there are other shoes to drop? How much the Fed really has a handle on this? I need some clarity on the regulatory failures <coughs> across the board here across several banks. Bramo, thanks for that. Looking forward to that report from Michael Barr a little bit later. Joining us now is Phil Orlando, Chief Equity Market Strategist at Federated Hermes. Phil, wonderful to catch up with you, sir. I want to go back to the question we started this program with, just how much momentum is in this economy from Q1 going into Q2 and looking out through the rest of the year? Uh, not much. That that you, you look at the GDP print yesterday at 1.1 percent. We were at 1.3 I think we were at or near the low on the street, so that was was a tough number. And regardless, um, our view is that the first quarter of GDP is going to be the high water mark for the year. We're expecting negative GDP prints in the third and the fourth quarter of this year. Uh, there are some folks that are looking for negative prints the beginning of next year. So uh, our view is that economic momentum is going to be downshifting here over the course of the next year or so. <clears throat> Phil Orlando, I want to talk about sell in May and go away. You have an arc of the market, an arc of many Mays that were successful and many Mays and summers that were less than successful. What is the character of sell in May and go away this year? I, I think it's sort of negative that you've had a very powerful six-month rally that's taken the market up about 20 percent here from the mid-October lows <clears throat> last year into the 4,200 level we've seen uh, here just recently. As we look out over the next couple of quarters, uh, you've got inflation that's still sticky, questions about how persistent, how hawkish Federal Reserve is going to be, uh, earnings are decelerating, questions about recession, questions about the impact uh, of banks tightening their yeah. lending standards, reducing their loan volumes. And then you've got the whole you know, debt ceiling issue that'll probably you know, uh, come to fruition here in the third quarter. So for all those right. reasons, our guess is, you know, uh, the, the market will probably grind uh -huh. lower over the next six months. Lisa, Ben Laidler of eToro this morning with an absolutely brilliant many decade history of this cliche, sell in May and go away. His answer is it's valid. And he really speaks of the mystery of the summer doldrums this year. Well, I think everything's been a mystery, frankly. 2023 could be chalked up as a full on mystery. And one of the big mysteries is what playbook do we whip out? And Phil, when you're talking about some sort of downshifting in Q3 and Q4, is this a recessionary playbook or is this a stagflationary playbook? Uh, our, our view is that we don't know. We're going to be data dependent. But right now, uh, the title of my presentation uh, for clients this year has been Recession Watch for 2023. We're, we're watching the data as, as closely as anyone. And again, we've got negative GDP prints in the third and the fourth quarter of this year. Uh, I've seen some economists with negative GDP prints in the first half of next year. So somewhere you know, within those winter months, uh, we're going to be coming up to that razor's edge of whether or not the economy slides over the edge in a recession. Phil, as you know, the market is not the economy. So can you give me the market call, equity leadership, which pockets of stocks you want to be in? Well, if we're right that this 20 percent six-month rally here reverses over the course of the next six months, then I think the, the answer to, you know, we've got the NFL draft going on. I, I think we want to keep the defense on the field right now. Uh, so we like cash. 
We like treasuries and we like defensive equities in, in stable demand categories. Uh, so large and small cap value stocks and international stocks uh, have low PEs, low betas, high dividend yields. So our, our, our mantra here is let's, let's hunker down, preserve some capital until we've got some clarity on some of these issues we've just talked about over the next couple of quarters. I can't get you to bite on the rally in the home builders on the S&P 500, Phil. Uh, the home builders have looked impressive here over the course of the last couple of months. We've yeah. been in a housing recession for the last seven or eight quarters. Uh, there's still tremendous pent up demand and the home builders have done better over the last couple of months. How sustainable is that? If the economy goes into recession, we'll have to see. But but uh, the home builders look attractive here. No question. Something's got to give. Just amazing. Phil Orlando of Federated Hermes. Phil talking up recession risk and at the same time likes what he sees in the home builders. Tom, can you reconcile those two things no, for me right I now? No, I can. And I think Phil, with all of his experience, said the same thing. Nobody's reconciling anything right now. And I'm going to go back to the highlight so far this morning, which is Lisa talking, what was it, Lisa, plus 12 on Amazon, minus 2, total 14-point swing. How often does that happen with a massive company like that? Never. Rarely. That's where we are. Rarely. Rarely. And it's about Rarely. a loss of momentum from Q1 <clears throat> into Q2, it's, which is the know, economic question of the day. It's like Manchester United, two goals up. And, I mean, it's sealed. They're gone. They're home. You know, that's it. And, boom, Alarian. You know, emails. Do you have Alarian this morning? Catch up with Mohammed at nine o'clock. Why don't we have him here? He won't get up that early. I think it's because you interrupt the conversation every That's time he comes on. That's probably why it is. I didn't interrupt be, it here. That might be the reason. He sends me in. He says the tots came back big time. Same idea. You know. Did you watch that game? I watched the highlights of it. I did not get to the game. Spurs were impressive in the second half. The second half created some, some spirit. opportunities. You know what I love? Relegation. I know you do. I you would love that to see baseball relegated. Who would you like to see relegated in? Whoever, you know, the, I mean, the Kansas City Royals and the Oakland A's would be oh, top of the list. You'd like to chop them up. No, that right now in the standings, that's where they would be. Okay. The New York Mets, Lisa, would not be relegated. <laughs> Maybe, depending on the year. Some years they might be. The Jets? The Jets in baseball would be relegated. <laughs> Tom, I think you know I meant football. Aaron Rodgers, you got any comment on that? It's fun. I mean, the Jets have been such is? an embarrassment fun. for so long that it'll at least be fun, be exciting. Yeah. They're not one of the favorites for the Super Bowl now? I, 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 don't, have the, I don't have the knowledge base to okay. go there. Well, this was great, yeah. so we won't do I'm sport I'm watching Formula today. One. Baku, Pierre Grassley mm, doing yeah. well this morning. Okay. Do you want to squeeze in another sport, a bit of basketball? No, I'd say no, on Formula done. One. It looks exciting. See me Shah in the next hour on the equity market and not sport. That conversation just around the corner. Nothing, Nick Snow, keep the sports talk going. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Well, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy stepped up his demands for President Biden and Democrats to avoid a debt ceiling crisis. McCarthy told Bloomberg TV they should embrace the plan that House Republicans passed that includes spending cuts. He said he's willing to make a deal. You know what happens with a compromise? We can get something together. It's what I sat down with the president the very beginning in February 1st. I said, Mr. President, why don't we sit down and work through it? There's two things I will not do, Mr. President. I will not raise taxes, and we will not pass a clean debt ceiling. But we can talk about everything else. The president has rejected the idea of a debt limit bill that also cuts spending. The Bank of Japan has scrapped its guidance on future interest rate levels at its first meeting under new Governor Kazuo Ueda. At the same time, it's keeping its main stimulus measures unchanged in pursuit of stronger inflation. That keeps the BOJ in a very different place than other central banks who are fighting rising hikes. And Russia launched a wave of missile attacks across Ukraine early today. The capital city of Kyiv was hit the first time it's been struck in more than a month. Explosions were also heard in five other regions. At least 12 people were killed. Ukraine says it shot down 11 cruise missiles and two drones. Amazon jolted investors with talk of a slowdown in cloud computing growth. The company's most profitable division saw a 16% gain in revenue in the first quarter. That's the slowest growth rate since Amazon began breaking out the unit's sales. Amazon is the largest seller of rented computing power and software services. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
things I've learned about Amazon, and it's been documented by, I think, your Brad Stone and others, but it, it's such an, a, a cellular organization. They have ways of reinventing themselves in ways that I don't think are widely appreciated. So I, I have some confidence that they can actually continue to find ways to grow in ways that we just can't expect. That was Brian Weezer of Madison and Wall. Love to catch up with Brian. I have to say, though, come on. The fact that an e-commerce company has become so dominant in cloud, I think we all appreciate the way that Amazon has reinvented itself. It's phenomenal that an e-commerce company has become so dominant in a business that should have been dominated by other firms. Other ones should have been there, and they weren't, and it really speaks to, I think, the vision they had and their method that they use, which is to cut costs along the way as their customers use the product more and more. How much does that cap its potential growth in this cloud unit, though? Because how many commerce companies are out there, or retail companies, that are going to say, do I really want to use the Amazon cloud service? Does this actually give Microsoft a leg up from a competitive advantage standpoint? I was more thinking about the lack of IBM not being in this market in a dominant way. The fact that it oh, came John. from Amazon and it didn't come from IBM, I still can't make <coughs> sense of that, Tom. Can't the, make sense of it. The scars of my youth. One of the advantages of gray hair, and our next guest uh, probably avoided this, is we were all uh, deluded by page three of the IBM annual report, which started every year with a free cash flow analysis that everything was fine, fine, fine. And Tom Keen and a lot of other people were wrong, wrong, wrong. Really important observations. They missed a massive growth opportunity. They missed strategic opportunities. In a rather large way. Mm -hmm. Let's get to some earnings. It comes from Chevron. <clears throat> First quarter EPS, adjusted EPS 355, the estimate 338. The number 355, the estimate 338. They break this down between upstream earnings and downstream earnings. Upstream 5.16 billion, the estimate 5.17. Downstream earnings 1.8 billion, the estimate 1.56 <clears throat> billion. I wonder if that number there at least will get the attention of this White House a little bit later. Basically, their input costs uh, and the earnings from that were not as great as what they sold perhaps at the pump, which is potentially a problem for the White House. Cash flow from Ops, $7.2 <coughs> billion. Adjusted cash flow from operations, $9 billion. We'll look for a CapEx number in just a moment. Tom, Exxon, later this hour. So look out for that. Chevron just about unchanged yeah, in the free market. What they're looking at is West Texas Intermediate. We haven't talked about 7495s had a moldy week. We're not on a 60 watch on an American barrel of oil, but that would change the dialogue to say uh, the least. This is a great pleasure. Stefan Slowinski joins us now with BMP Paribas, and it's real simple. He's got that unique thing. All of you with kids at home are opening college acceptance letters right now, and you're going, oh, well, should we do major, 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 minor? Pennsylvania invented the triple major, and Slowinski is an undergraduate. was one of those rare beasts with three degrees out of one institution. He's an odd duck. Stefan, congratulations on software and BMP Paribas. I love what you say about Amazon, which is they're just beginning to climb the hill of cash flow recovery. How did they get back to a free cash flow that was COVID-like? Yeah, hi, Tom, and, and thanks for having me on the program. Yeah, I mean, free cash flow has been a problem for Amazon the last couple of years. Last year, they had $12 billion of free cash outflow. Um, and really, there's three things driving that. One is obviously weak profits. Um, and so we're starting to see some improvement in operating profit coming through, but it's very slow. Um, but, you know, inflation headwinds should ease. Um, supply chain headwinds should ease. The second thing is um, the uh, working capital movements. So again, the last two years, they had $20 billion of working capital outflow. Um, again, we should see that uh, improve this year. As I mentioned, those supply chain challenges should be easing, which should help working, cap working capital flow. But we haven't seen it yet. Again, in Q1, they missed um, <clears throat> big time on free cash flow with negative $8 oh. billion. Um, and then the third thing is CapEx. Um, and again, that's really spiked to $60 billion last year. They did say last night that we should see a decline this year. However, right. some of those savings are being put back into AI, of course, and, and that's another sort of CapEx uh, driver to come for the future for this company and for others. Stephen, Lisa's got some important immediate questions. I want to do a look back here and rip up the script. What kind of right. Amazon did Jeff Bezos leave Jesse and the rest of them. Do you like blame Jeff Bezos for what they've been through in the last 12 months? No, uh, of course, uh, you know, since the company was founded, they've always made big bets and some of them have paid off and some of them haven't. Uh, Amazon Web Services, as you were just discussing, is 
one of those big bets that did pay off. Clearly, if we go back 12 to 15 months, Amazon made a bet that the Omicron variant would trigger a sort of another uh, COVID-induced um, demand cycle in 2022, and that didn't play out. So they found themselves caught offside. Uh, but I think maybe the market is underestimating that at the beginning of last year, Amazon made some very important strategic decisions about how to run the business in the future. Um, and I do think that they're making efforts to get this business overall to sustainable profitability, uh, even through a cycle. Um, so that's whether we go through a recession, whether we go through inflation. I, again, it's just taking time to see that come through. And I think that's the frustrating thing for investors is the market always seems to be ahead of itself on this one, a bit too ahead of itself. Um, and despite all of the literally dozens of headlines we've seen over the last 12 months around shutting down divisions and cutting costs and exiting leases, we're still seeing an, an EBIT for the consumer business at essentially zero. Stefan, you're generous in saying that the market seems to be ahead of itself. Other people would say it's crazy right now. It's absolutely nuts and irrational when you start to see, a, you know, 100, 200 billion dollar swings in stock valuations in just hours based on a couple of phrases, a couple of words, not necessarily even forward looking projections. So what do you draw from that level of volatility that we're seeing in some of the tech shares really exemplified by Amazon in particular? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a question around the broader market right now. Uh, you know, obviously, big tech always seems to tick a lot of boxes, whether it's the flight to safety this year um, because of some of the, the challenges in the financial services sector, um, whether it's uh, some companies clearly struggling with growth and, and others able to power through that. We saw Microsoft this week power through some demand concerns with price increases. We saw Google this week power through with strong search and Obviously, results last night from Snap and Pinterest just make those results that much more attractive. Um, but, uh, you know, at the same time, you have nervous investors. Uh, you know, people are looking at some of these valuations on some of these big tech names. And, and these are positions that are the biggest in their portfolios, and they're nervous. And so, you know, when we do see any sort of negativity, we get quick drawdowns. Um, but also, we see people not wanting to get off the bus because if these are the only games in town, if these themes, the AI theme, continue to run, they don't want to miss it. And obviously, you can really be hurt by underperformance by being underweight just a few of these big names. Stefan, thank you, sir, for weighing in. Stefan Slowinski there of BNP Paribas. On some of these moves we've seen here today, I don't know if you'd feel nervous being in Meta, if you've been in that one, up by close to 100% year today. I think some people in that name, Tom, thrilled yeah, about I, the performance they've had so far. And, and the bears would say, well, it was a bounce off the mat. And, of course, they're going to reaffirm some form of intermediate bull market that becomes a bear market trend again. But you know, I just think it, it's it's almost like a cacophony. It's almost like a resonance, an oscillation that we're under, and we're living that guest to guest. Yeah, never mind the fear of missing out. You missed out. Yet today, the rally's been absolutely phenomenal. You've made back, on, on SPX, you've made back half your bear market. And the NASDAQ, you're there. Like you say in Meta, you've done it. Can I return back to Chevron? <clears throat> and thank Please. you to Kevin Crowley for writing up looked. this story. The refining story is just phenomenal. $1.8 billion during the period from their fleet of refineries, exceeding expectations. And this stat right here, a five-fold increase from the first quarter of 2022. Lisa, I know the stock's only up by a third of 1%, but just looking through those numbers, that, that refining number is pretty phenomenal. Especially at a time when that really has been one of the key uh, tension points around getting gasoline, let alone the oil prices being where they are and being actually a little bit more suppressed. If you have a lack of refineries, and we've talked about this, it is a closed market. If you're in it, you can really uh, get, that, get those profits. But Washington, D.C. is going to be the real question. Who wants to build a refiner right now? No one. Who wants to invest not that in my money? backyard. No, not in your backyard. No, You've got space in your backyard for a refiner. I do. Yeah, Maybe. <laughs> that bill's going to be at it. <laughs> Stock is positive by a third of 1%. Exxon, later this hour. Live from New York City this Friday morning. Good morning. Welcome to the program. Getting you to the weekend with your equity market a little bit softer, lighter, lower, down, negative 0.3%. Was that a good drink? You seem this, so happy with yourself after having that. 
Yeah, what was I that am. face? I wish we this could have got Sanka. that on camera. You don't, okay. you don't know what Sanka is. You, you have Marmite. We had Sanka when we were kids. It's like a... It, looked it, like Marmite, Sanka, yeah, right? It's in sure. honor of my mother. I'm having Sanka today. <laughs> OK. We're negative 0.3% on the NASDAQ 100. On the week so far, the S&P 500 pretty flat on the NASDAQ. Doing better than good off the back of some solid earnings. We'll see if that turns around a little bit later. Just to round things up in the bond market, then I want to get you some earnings from Exxon. Looking at the two-year, would you believe it? On the month of April, yeah. the two-year, if I told you, was basically unchanged. The two-year yield is higher by just a couple of basis points on the month so far. I can tell you the high was 428 for April. The low in April, Tom, 364. That one's been all over the place right now, just a little north of 4%. Yeah, the, tr the trophy for April's got to be the difference between the Treasury bill, the three-month paper, John, and the 10-year Treasury note, the benchmark. And we moved out the massive inversion of near 170 basis points. All you need to know, folks, is back 30 years, that's never happened. With these sky-high elevated short-term rates and the bid on paper and lower yields farther out. That's about the only story I can glean here as a bond trend. I promised you some Exxon numbers, and then I'll return to the FX market and give you the roundup on a single currency. Exxon, first quarter adjusted EPS 283, the estimate 263. Tons of headlines. Lisa's looking through them. We're negative 0.6% on Exxon in the pre-market. They say they're on track, Lisa, to buy back up to $17.5 billion of stock during the year. They also say that their total revenue in the first quarter and other income was $86.6 .6 billion. The estimate was for $84.6 or about a billion dollars, so a significant beat. And this is what's interesting to me. We talk about CapEx, how much our business is actually going to invest. They expect capital, uh, capital expenditures to be about 23 to $25 billion versus the estimate of $21 billion. So how much is this a nod also to the government <laughs> saying, OK, we'll invest more, we'll do more, look at that. We could do. We can uh, cross off uh, those particular issues and then continue to make bank, which is clearly what they did. The energy names have had a phenomenal <laughs> couple of years. A bit of a struggle, I have to say, year to date relative to the boom we've seen in tech. Yeah. Backing away a little bit here, Tom, in the pre-market, negative 0.3 percent. Let's put things in scale. We got to get to an important guest here, John, on foreign exchange. We've got free cash flow looking out 24 months on Exxon. Call it 40 billion. That's le oh, less than double Apple's 100 billion dollars. 40 billion free cash flow Exxon. That's how puny they are to Apple at 100 billion plus. We'll return back to the energy story in just a moment. I want to sit on foreign exchange just briefly. <clears throat> high of the year. We got a new high of the year a little bit earlier this week. 110.95 on the euro against the dollar. A break of 110 now, though. Negative a third of 1%. The dollar making a bit of a comeback here at 109.90 on the euro against the US dollar. Here's the Goldman Sachs view of things. They write the following. The euro is trading close to our year-end forecast <coughs> for the second time this year. We think ultimately the upside is capped because the space for divergence is fairly limited. Underlying economic conditions are not all that different, but it should be noted that the euro is certainly holding up its end of the equation rather well. While there are more question marks, Tom, on the dollar side. Right now we're going to do this with Camacho Trevetti, and it's very important here to track the euro into what we see across this globe. Camacho, all the focus is on euro dollar, euro in the United States. And yet we see so much about Europe and a new Pacific Rim. You center it out is Euro and Japan, which is a traditional big pair, and less obscured Euro Renminbi or Euro China, which is a more intelligent way to look at this, Euro Japan or Euro China? I think they're both picking up important aspects of what is going on. You mentioned earlier about how the two-year ra rate in the U.S. has been pretty much range-bound for the year. When you look at the broad dollar, that's been pretty much flat for the, for the month of April as well. And, you know, part of that is that there are big differences going on underneath the hood. The fact that euro has had some, uh, you know, solid reasons why it is trading as strongly as it is. The nominal GDP news in Europe has been pretty good at the same time time, uh, you had, you know, weakness in North Asia. That includes the yen, uh, you know, given another, you know, Philip by the, uh, you know, relatively dovish uh, uh, meeting today that we got. But it includes CNY, which has been underperforming. It includes the Korean won as well. So I think the real story in FX markets over the past month and a little bit longer even has been this sort of twist underneath the dollar, which is what has happened in Euro Asia. When you look at Asia, the core issue here is China growth. Some the Goldman Sachs view 
on the durability of five or, dare I say, 6% China GDP, and then what does that do to their renminbi policy? I think the growth view here is that the easy part is done, right? Like we've had the stellar rebound from the COVID shutdowns in the first quarter uh, that was stronger than many people expected. I think from here, it would not be surprising if you saw a slower pace of growth as we go back to something like trend. And the remaining parts of reopening that are left, things like international travel, uh, as that picks up, that's not going to be a renminbi positive. If anything, it's going to boost the service sector deficit of China. It's a better uh, tailwind for something like the Thai bot, which tends to benefit a lot from international tourism. So I think the sort of growth tailwind to the CNY is done and is part of the reason why, given the low inflation, uh, the punitive negative carry as well, you know, the Chinese currency can continue to be a, a sort of funding trader on the short side of a lot of EM carry, uh, carry trades. Taking a step back, uh Kamakshia, a lot of people thought of China as was sort of the sun of this year, the sun of economic growth that was shedding some warmth on Europe, and the U.S. was further away, so it wasn't getting as much of that, and you saw that reflected in some of the performances of certain uh, companies. The closer they were to that sun, the better they did. How long can that keep bolstering the euro versus the dollar, based on the fact that, as you say, it seems to be waning a bit? It's already been priced in. I think that's right. I think it is it is waning uh, it is waning a bit, and I think also you know if you think about what the, the factors that have been supporting the euro, the kind of high inflation, you know, fewer worries on the growth side or, or banking issues that have been sort of plaguing the U.S. to some extent, um, you know, all of those have been supporting the the euro. Some of them can extend a little bit further. You know, we're priced or the market is priced for the ECB to hike, you know, more substantially than the Fed over the next six months. But I think we are coming closer to the point where Europe also has its inflation relief moment. That's a good way for some of the support for the euro to sort of be, uh, be somewhat diminished. Uh, and, you know, we haven't quite seen any of the stresses that you traditionally see in Europe when you have a policy tightening, things like sovereign spreads and so on. So, you know, I think it makes sense what the euro has done, given what is the news we've had. But I think there are limits to this divergence with the U.S. Looking ahead to next week, that divergence will be on cold relief when we see both the Federal Reserve meet as well as the ECB. And it strikes me that both regions are kind of heading into a stagflationary kind of environment because, yes, we might be hitting a tipping point, a downward trajectory with inflation, but growth is coming in and inflation is still too high. What is the playbook for some of these central banks, given that kind of backdrop? I think ultimately, you know, the playbook is not that different across different central banks. I think there is a ga there's a there's a difference in timing about when they move. But you know, you've seen even this month a number of G10 central banks, whether it's uh, you know the Riks Bank in Sweden, whether it's the Bank of Japan today. You know, we've seen somewhat more dovish shifts or at least dovish uh, you know commentary from these central banks. I think in many places it looks like disinflation is progressing, but progressing only slowly, and the central banks want. To to pause or want to uh, step down the pace of tightening that they have been delivering. I think we'll hear something similar from the Fed next week. I think the ECB may take a month longer before they get to that point. And I think that's the, that's the near-term divergence one has to be careful about. But ultimately, we don't think these central banks uh, or these macroeconomy you know, are, are in such different places. Hardly talked about the ECB going into next week. Kamaksha, thanks for your time, sir. As always, Kamaksha Trevetti there of Goldman Sachs going into the Federal Reserve May 3rd, May 4th, the European Central Bank decision. Here's the word from Sabatra Japra over at SOCGEN. Not so fast. They go on to say, the Fed is widely expected to deliver its last rate hike of the cycle as the ECB catches up by delivering a 50 basis point hike next week, taking us one step closer to the end. But... Here's the important but, Tom. Global inflation woes are far from over. Data dependence implies greater vigilance and more volatility in global rates. And they end with this. Buckle up. Buckle up is the word yeah. coming out of SOCGEN. Into my weekend reading. Of course, they've got a wonderful view from Paris. But into my weekend reading, these are not apples and apples. The inflation character across all of continental Europe and the United Kingdom is totally different than the United States. I don't think... The dialogue of Frankfurt and Washington is even remotely the same. What do you think is different about it? What's most pronounced the, for you? The, the confidence in the United States, for whatever reason, that we can get down to where Ed Hyman is 
on 3% or less inflation, the Steve Major discussion, the David Rosenberg discussion. I don't hear that discussion in Europe. Is the labour market, Lisa, pushing back against that view? That's the issue, right? And that's been the key distinction over in Europe, where you see a lot of the strikes, a lot of the protests with respect to labour, trying to get uh, more benefits, higher wages. Is it really so different than the U.S.? And we'll see with the ECI coming out in about two hours, a little bit less than that. How much really is it different? Don't we see those employment cost indexes going up, especially for the people who actually go out and do stuff and the line workers? Don't you think to some extent that people are just exhausted by some of these conversations? Yes. Just totally exasperated. Right, going into next week. Then there's a feeling that they're almost done, but there's a feeling that they want them to be almost done. Are you talking right? about yourself? Oh, without a doubt. You know, straight up, I'm talking about myself. 100%. And, I'm right and, there and, with and, you. And everybody I talk to about the same thing. To, to the emotion that we're in, in the, the clarion call Monday morning of sell in May and go away, you, if you want to sell in May, you got to be in the market. And I believe most of the statistics tell me most people aren't enjoying the, this market. Yeah. So there's nothing to sell in May if you're not in the game. I'm not sure how many people enjoyed that run-up in Meta yeah. of almost 100%. Well, is it, yeah, but the market in general, I mean, basically the <laughs> SPX has made back half their bear market. I'm just thinking, are you not entertained? I feel like the market is coming to us and saying that again and again. I mean, it's not a fun market because it's just sticky and, <clears throat> and back and forth. And, you know, we talk about, you're saying, will the momentum continue into the second quarter? You're saying, do you sell in May and then go away? And I just wonder, what is the playbook that we're heading into, right? Are we heading into some sort of recession? Are we heading into stagflation? What do you right. do with that as a trader after not having seen that? What you do with it, right? Right now, folks, is look to the Bramo newsletter. It's been a hit for April. Do you think that you, cool. it's got legs for May? I think. I think, I think it, can it has. I think out that's as well. the one thing right now that's got some real momentum. It does. It's, it's, it's the only food. thing here that's got <laughs> real momentum. Food. The only thing on this program that has, <laughs> given our performance so far this morning. A little bit later on this morning, Lisa mentioned it, 11 a.m. Eastern time. You are going to get Michael Barr's report on the collapse of SVB, the Vice Chair for Supervision over at the Federal Reserve. And that's going to be a key one a little bit later on today. Equity futures, negative 0.4% from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Speaker Kevin McCarthy is putting the pressure on President Biden and Democrats to embrace his plan that was passed on the House floor in order to avoid a debt limit crisis. In an interview with Bloomberg TV, he said the president is putting the economy at risk by avoiding a negotiation. Biden opposes the measure because it includes sweeping spending cuts in order to raise the debt ceiling. In China, the Communist Party's Politburo said the country's economic recovery needs continued fiscal and monetary support. It also warned that domestic demand is insufficient. The Politburo is the top decision-making body led by President Xi Jinping. In the UK, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's government has signaled it will break its pledge to scrap laws from when the country was in the EU. That could enrage Conservative Party Brexit supporters. Sunak had promised to review or get rid of all the laws by the end of this year. Instead, the government suggests it will scrap just a fraction of them by that deadline. Shares of Intel are rising. The embattled chipmaker has promised a recovery in the second half of the year. That prompted investors to look past a disappointing profit margin forecast in the current quarter. Intel said it's returning to full manufacturing capacity and an inventory glut affecting the personal computer market is coming to an end. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. The Fed took rates from zero to four and three quarters percent in 12 months. There are consequences. It's not just, okay, Silicon Valley Bank is signature uh, and we get up and dust ourselves off and ride off into the sunset. There are more consequences. Might it be another financial institution or two? Could be. My view is it will include a mild recession. Hopefully it's only mild. 
It's the beginning of a process. That seems to be the view of Bob Dole, the CIO at Crossmark Global Investments. We caught up with him just yesterday. Looking forward to the conversation on these issues with Mohammed al Erin a little bit later this morning. We'll do that in a couple of hours on Bloomberg TV. As we're in the market, equity futures, negative 0.4% on the S&P 500. Looking at a bond market with yields lower by four or five basis points on a 10-year, 347.30. TK, what have you got? What do we got right now is a headline, and it is a simple headline, and this is breaking news and maybe speaks to getting ahead of Labor Day in the autumn. Lazard to cut about 10 percent of workforce. Usually the cuts, John, are a constructive 3 percent, 2 percent, 4 percent's big, 10 percent is not 4 percent. And what they're saying really about the outlook being uncertain I think speaks to what we've heard from some of the big players on Wall Street too in the investment bank about what's been happening with M&A activity. At least a slow M&A activity resulting in significantly lower revenue. Speaking to what we've heard from elsewhere. This is what we've seen pretty consistently and it really raises this issue of how important it is for banks to be large and have lots of different segments that offset one another. We saw from the biggest banks that, yes, they expect M&A uh, volumes to continue to go down, but they have big investment banking revenues, they have uh, the big consumer banking revenues, and that offsets it all. This is the larger question of how big does a bank need to be to be successful at a time when politicians are kind of warming up to the idea that big is better, ironically, this many years after the crisis. A financial advisory revenue, Tom, 274 yeah. million dollars the estimate 296 i would suggest that is a bit of a downside surprise there asset management revenue 265 against an estimate of 262 i'll keep going through the numbers tom ken jacobs uh, driving the ship here as chairman ray mcguire as well let's remember this is 3400 employees it is a small shop maybe like the beleaguered first republic bank not to compare them to i believe lazard is providing advice in some of these banking uh dramas that we see now we get lucky with the news from lazard for global wall street on radio and on television myra rodriguez valadares with us now of mrv associates we were scheduled to talk about should i do my passbook savings book account at this bank or that bank forget about it myra you are experienced in global wall street Will we see the larger firms mimic what we see this morning at Lazard? I think, unfortunately, you are going to be having some layoffs, even at the globally systemically important banks. Uh, you do have a slowdown in mergers and acquisitions. All of the big banks showed that in, the, in their earnings in the last uh, couple of weeks. You've already had some very large <coughs> consulting firms, tech firms laying off people, and so it is you know, the labor market is still tight, but you are starting to see some softening, and that is definitely going to impact banks of every size, I'm afraid. You, oh, you, you're too young to know. I remember this clear as a bell, and let's go to E.F. Hutton just as one example. But when things get tough, combinations are in order. We all learned that from Andrew Mellon a few years ago. Can you predict with the challenges that Lazard speaks of this morning that we will see constructive combinations over the next 24 months? Yes, I think you are going to have layoffs, and it is going to have to be done very, very carefully. Unfortunately, what we've already seen is that there's a lot of high earners who are being laid off. And so that is going to impact states. It's obviously going to impact the broader economy. Uh, I'm hoping we're done with the banking turmoil soon. I think First Republic is going to be, and it is being worked on right now and that was the bank that has suffered the greatest amount in terms of loss of deposits but i'm really hoping that we're coming to the end of this however the large banks and the independent investment banks like lazards are still being affected by what's happening in the broader economy there's no way to escape that Myra, is there an irony to all of this that however many years after the great financial crisis, the biggest banks are viewed as the best and actually have the most favor in Washington, D.C. right now when it comes to looking like stalwarts through turmoil? Right. I mean, there is a bit of irony, but what we have to remember here is not that they're big. I mean, yes, of course, that helps. What really helps these institutions is that they are so incredibly diverse. They have retail banking, commercial banking, asset management, custody, uh, of course, broker dealers. And that's really what's helping JP Morgan, Citibank, you know, Wells Fargo. When you get to the regional banks and even smaller, they are just nowhere near as diverse. 
both in their assets and in their liabilities. And that's really what's hurt banks like Silicon Valley, Signature, First Republic. And so it shouldn't just be that they're large. What we need to be looking at is how diverse are they? That's really what's going to help them get through this storm. We've talked on the show, and John has really uh, said well about how people are averse to saying crisis in this particular capacity, because it reckons back, harkens back to 2008. And yet, it seems like there is a slow rolling problem in some of these regional banks that isn't going to go away overnight. And I was struck by yesterday's data from the Fed showing an increase in the emergency borrowing from the discount window, from the emergency lending program that they just started up. Is your sense that this slow-moving kerfuffle, or whatever you want to call it, is continuing to accelerate under the hood, taking out some of the biggest problem children? Yes, no. I mean, it is significant, serious banking turmoil. There's no way of, of denying that. And unfortunately, it has to do with quite a number of regional banks that forgot the basics of banking, which is to always be identifying and measuring your interest rate risk and your liquidity risk. And every single bank regulator has it on their websites that it is essential for all risk managers to always be monitoring interest rate risk. I realize that for anybody who's just come on board onto Wall Street or the city of London in the last couple of years, they'd never seen an interest rate rise. I, I get that, but <laughs> it is, it's banking 101, right? Interest rates go up and they do come down. And if you can't manage that, you shouldn't be in banking. Uh, I'm not sure it's the junior analyst in London that needs to be told about that or on Wall Street. Maybe it's the supervisor, Mara, because the supervisory failure over all of this has been phenomenal. Just to look back, when we get the report from Barr a little bit later, what specifically are you expected to see in that? I'm, I'm not going to be surprised at all that you're going to find out that there were lots of supervisors who did know that this was going on. We have to remember that off-site bank supervisors and bank examiners can't get on Twitter or come on this program and explain what's been going on, right? They're not, they're not allowed to talk to the media. Uh, and there were many of them who have known. Uh, the question is, what happened at the very top. And we did have a couple of years before this current administration where it was very much a hands off these banks. The tone at the top was very different from what we have now. And so unfortunately, this is all caught up and it is a, it is a real problem. You do need to empower middle level and other bank examiners to do their job. The problem is that if the tone at the top is hands off, yep. then that, that filters down. It's a real problem. It go, but goes back to the chairman all over again. Mara, thank you for being with us. Mara Rodriguez, well Baradaris of MRV. It's amazing our booking could do that. They could you know, get Mara on right it's when Lazard comes out. conversation a little bit later. <clears throat> I have to say this. I understand why people don't like the word crisis. I understand that it's not 2008. And I understand there is a a duty when you're talking about these things not to stoke fear. I get all of that. But when you get the failure of SVB, Silvergate, Signature, Credit Suisse, idiosyncratic, 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 idiosyncratic. Until... The question I'm asking at the moment is, OK, if that's your view, that's fine, and that seems to be the consensus view. I'm not here to interrogate that. I want to understand how many more banks would need to fail before you would sit there and say that it's not idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic, that there is a broader issue at play here that's going to lead to some broader problems in the future. The issue here is also how do you draw the distinction between perhaps not a wholesale cascade of, of failures, but perhaps this sort of slow grind of one bank being acquired by another in a forced sort of merger, lending coming in, something that could affect the economy much more and is harder for, say, Fed officials to come in and stop with monetary well, policy the way they did in 2008. So it could have actually a longer lasting lag on the economy in a way that perhaps is difficult to price in or even extrapolate out. You mentioned sequential becoming from idiosyncratic to mainstream. I would say, and I borrow this from Hilarion and game theory, going back to uh, Frank Ramsey, the unknown unknown is what's out there. And you get a respect for that after you screwed this up in calculable times like I have. Seeing stability. Unknown unknowns. Seeing some stability, but that doesn't mean the story's over. In the equity market, <clears> the <throat> S&P 500, negative 0.4%. This is Bloomberg.
people talking about a slowdown in the economy, except the S&P sits at 4,100. I do think that there is a danger that tech can't continue to do the heavy lifting for the entire market here. Broadly speaking, businesses are anticipating a slowdown in the economy. All those lead indicators pointing to slowdown slash mild recession. I don't see how we escape it. I really do think that the, the data are going to have the Fed hiking further. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market negative 0.4%. It's been a monster week for big tech. It continues into next week with Apple on deck. Later on next week, with the Federal Reserve and ECB decision somewhere in between, the Federal Reserve next Wednesday term on Thursday, the ECB. Then after the close that day, we'll hear from Apple. We'll, we'll hear from Apple as well. And, and I, I, I do take the point it's a busy week, but I think it's a week after the exhaustion of April. Do we get clarity in May? Can we say that May maybe will provide just an overall theme that was missing this month. It can't get worse than this, can it? There is one report in May that we've spent the whole of April talking about, and that is the Senior Loan Officer Opinion Survey that will be released in early May that the Federal Reserve should, Lisa, have in hand when it meets next week and presents perhaps some of the ideas that come from it in the news conference. And I think we go back to the original question in March and have to keep on returning to it. To what extent will this stress be a substitute for rate hikes? Will they have an answer Next week, I doubt it. Will there be closer to an answer? Maybe. This could take weeks, months, maybe even quarters. I can feel the frustration in your voice as you think to yourself, we're going to be asking the same thing for the next two months, three months, and have no answers, and be asking the same questions, and everybody will. Is this, though, and I keep going back to this. Yesterday, I was, I was asking about this as well. Is this basically the economy that called wolf, right? How many times can people say, OK, it's going to be a recession. It's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. And then it just is good, good, good. And then people aren't prepared for when it actually sours. But it's going to eventually sour. Momentum. Have we lost momentum? Overwhelmingly, consensus seems to indicate, what, Tom. First Republic? We've lost momentum. No, in the U.S. economy. From first quarter into yeah, second quarter. I, I think, y yes, I think we confirmed yesterday. And, you know, you see a little bit of stagflation out there in the research reports. But, yes, we didn't get the enthusiasms that we thought we'd get yesterday. And we still got to get revisions on that. Amazon's guidance speaks to that as well. <clears throat> Losing momentum from the first quarter going into April. A loss of momentum. But then there are all these little pockets of tension for me. The idea that we've had a 70% rally off the June lows on the home builders on the S&P 500 does not scream recession to me. Does it scream recession to you? It screams rebound, which is what you're maybe seeing actually marginally in some of the data. Honestly, getting any clarity right now is very difficult. People are looking right now to get a better sense of what's going on in the regional banks. And the latest is New York Community Bank Corp coming out with the first quarter. What everyone's keying in on, deposits come in lighter than expected. And we can parse through this. But to me, how much focus is going to be on that drip, drip, drip of what's happening well, with deposits flowing out of banks? Full disclosure, NYCB has been a sponsor of all that we do here at Bloomberg surveillance and we thank them for their support on that. But separate, John, right on the NYCB headlines, FRC gave way. FRC's had a very constructive morning off a close of 6.19 and boom, at a 6.65, they come right down to 6.47. The cont Not contagion, that's too inflammatory. The impact of NYCB goes across the nation to FRC. FRC is still a bank looking for a solution. <clears throat> when yes. we spoke to Jenny Montgomery Scott a little bit earlier this week, they turned around and basically said three options on the table here. Lease or sell assets, raise capital, or fail. On the first two, we really haven't heard much on the first two at all, all week. Probably the reason why is because there's a massive tension. The government doesn't want to bail out J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, and Bank of America, who put $30 billion of deposits in, in this bank. And at the same time, unless oh. they have some sort of support, there is going to be no sale because people need to have a guarantee of loan losses and someone needs to bridge yeah. the difference. Jenny Serain and our team reports on this this morning, and I think Matt Levine did a great job summarizing up for Bloomberg Opinion is, well, my focus into the weekend, John, is not on James Diamond, not on Brian Moynihan and the rest of the cohort. It's on the government. The government here has to blink and visibly blink at some point. I don't see that yet. They've been very quiet. Very, very quiet. You're going to get a report on the failure of SVB a little bit later. Lisa will give you the time of that in just a moment. Here's the broader price action for you. Negative 0.4% as we stumble, crawl towards the weekend and look forward to close this one out. 
this week so far. Yield to lower by four basis points. <laughs> you really feel? Three forty-seven, <laughs> eighty-seven. I'm going to spend the whole morning. Is it over yet? Spring into poetry here at some point. <laughs> What's the whole thing about? You know, morning TV and morning radio. You've got to be happy. You know, all of that stuff. No, not today. Can I finish on the FX market? The euro, just briefly. Crushing it. Euro dollar came really close to one eleven a little bit earlier this week. It's backed away since then. One hundred nine eighty-four ton. What's that? It's my well, morning, no one on TV can see that. TV, what is that? It's my morning TV smile on okay. radio. It's right. Okay, you're sort of gritting your teeth. Is that how you feel <laughs> about this week I'm as well? My te- yeah. Can I, Ramo? <clears throat> of course you can. <laughs> all right, let's Whatever talk you about want it. to do, you can. <laughs> okay. Can I? Whatever it is. A very sure. cheerful brief. Good morning. I hope that you all had a great week. We have gotten an earnings roll throughout the week. We did get Exxon and Chevron. Interesting that they both beat. Really, the focus is going to be probably more on Chevron than Exxon, even though Exxon shares up about a half of a percent after a big beat. Chevron really delivering incredible refining profits, which will raise some uh, headlines, uh, raise some uh, eyebrows over in Washington, D.C. 8.30 a.m., we get a slew of data, personal income personal spending, PCE deflator at 11 a.m., uh, 10 a.m., rather, University of Michigan sentiment survey. But what I am watching is the employment cost index that comes out in about 90 minutes' time. Are we seeing a reacceleration in wages, and what does that do for the Fed? And speaking of the Fed, 11 a.m. is the time for that review, what we get from Michael Barr, who is vice chair of supervision at the Federal Reserve. He'll be releasing that. What went wrong with Silicon Valley Bank? Where are the p- fingers pointed? Is it all on Randy Quarles, who is no longer there, or is it also at Jerome Powell? That was way too upbeat, wasn't it, Tom? Just way too upbeat. You keep gritting your teeth. Joining us now is Seema Shah, <laughs> chief global strategist at <laughs> Principal Asset Management. <laughs> Wishing she never woke up early this morning to join this program. Seema, good morning. Good morning. It's great to be here. Great to have you with us. This recession chat, what underpins (laughs) it? Where's where's it come from? I think a lot of people might look at this situation and say, well, yes, inflation's a problem, but I'm looking at unemployment, 3.5%. Claims have ticked a little bit higher, but they've come back in again. Where's the recession chat come from, apart from maybe we're due one? Well, so we are due one. Uh, I think the problem is that we've been talking about recession for ages and ages and ages. And as you said, people are getting a little bit tired of the discussions. But if you look around the economy today, it looks fairly strong. Yes, there's a soft slowdown happening, but generally speaking, things look okay. And I think the main reason is that the labour market is underpinning underpinning everything. But if I put my economist hat on, labour market is typically the last one to fall. It is the most lagging indicator here, but it's also the most important. So we can be watching, you know, the, the lending survey is going to be really important. There is a very, very close correlation between lending data and employment. So as you see a lending contract, you should see job losses increase. So we are expecting recession late this year and everyone kind of like keeps being pushed out. But it does look very, very likely given the amount of Fed tightening you've seen to date. Markets are almost hoping for this recession. Bring it forward. Let's get it over with. And then we can start with the next cycle. And it seems like that impatience has been embedded in all of the bearishness that we felt. What's worse for risk assets, though, a recession at this point or stagflation? Oh, stagflation by far. That, that is the worst case scenario. You know, one of the things that has been underpinning markets to this point is this idea that at some point uh, in the next six months, eight months, is that the Fed is going to start cutting rates. There is a lot of assumption out there that inflation is going to keep coming down. That is the consensus forecast. And there's very, very little dispersion in those expectations. So inflation, if it were to reignite and start moving up, that takes away everything which is underpinning the market today. So if we get this ECI print showing that employment costs reaccelerated, which some people expect that to be uh, the base case, what does that mean in terms of exactly what you just said? Right. That means that the Fed's job is not done. You know, we, we, I think, are seeing that, look, we're getting towards the end of the tightening cycle. Everyone believes that there's going to be a rate hike in May, but almost no one is talking about beyond May. The other part that nobody's talking about is not only that could they pause, but why couldn't they also return to the market in September with a new rate hike if things are not going as planned? You know, they have said that they're very data dependent. They have said that they need to watch and see what the impact of, of Fed tightening is going to be. And if you're not seeing wage growth come down and if actually you're seeing inflation really plateau at the kind of a four and a half percent level, what's to stop them from doing a new rate hike? Now, that I want to clarify, that is not our baseline expectation, sure. but I would put a fairly meaningful chance on that, probably more than what the market is putting right now. You're over from London. Can you tell me so far this week in the conversations you've had, the kind of differences that you're experiencing in the conversations here about the US versus, say, London about the US? Are they different at all? They are a little bit different in that no one in the UK is talking about the debt limit. I mean, I, and I find that for international investors generally, they kind of, yeah, we go through this every few years and it always passes okay. 
and I find that in the US there is definitely a lot more concern. Almost every single client conversation I've had that has come up is a really con significant concern. Who's got it right? Can I say international? Look, you think so? I, I do. I, look, I, I think that the chances that the chances of a default are higher than they have been previously, partly because <clears throat> this administration is so belligerent. But, and that volatility is very disruptive when the market is already very, very vulnerable to Just any kind of nice. disruption. I shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> I don't take it back. Though. Okay, so so that is what is disruptive. But I do think that things will eventually all get passed. I'll be fine. I'm not here to correct you either. This was wonderful. Do you want to talk about US politics sometime in the future? Next week, the week after that? <laughs> we could do a weekly segment, couldn't we? <laughs> Let's save her. I think you, I'm should, so you should always ask what the people in London think about the situation <clears throat> over here because they seem to have a very, very different view on things. That was fantastic. It was like, can I say the truth? OK, I won't. Here, Here's what I'm going to tell clients. It's OK. That is yeah, interesting, though, Seema, that they seem to be shaking it off here. What do you think it is about the US-based investor and why they're so much more obsessed with it here? And I wouldn't... Maybe I'm using that word obsessed loosely. Why they're paying more attention to it here? Is there good reason for it? I think this is standard of investors. You look at your own local market and you're always more negative about your own market. That goes across the board. I'm probably more negative about the UK than my US colleagues. The same thing in the US, same thing in Hong Kong, and China. Come that, here that every is... day. <laughs> this is Daniel from <laughs> Iowa just emailed, emailed in and said President Biden is not belligerent. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Seema, Daniel's the chairman of Principal Asset Management. Seema, appreciate it. It's, there's great. no email on his screen. Don't worry about it. I'm not in <laughs> Seema Shah of Principal Asset Management. Well, if, if I said that, can you imagine? I'd be we we, we can't say here. that. Yeah. We can't say that. But our guests yeah. can say that they if they wish. That. They, they see can. reason to. Yes, they can. They're entitled to their Very opinion good. on the administration. You're being belligerent. Anne Marie doesn't have an opinion. She'll join us shortly. She'll give you the view of things down in Washington. And later. Set page of T. Rowe Price in the next hour. Looking forward to that conversation. In the equity market, negative 0.4%. Good morning, Mr. President, if you're watching. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was Seema Sharp, <laughs> principal <laughs> asset management. <laughs> <laughs>Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy stepped up his demands for President Biden and Democrats to avoid a debt ceiling crisis. McCarthy told Bloomberg TV they should embrace the plan that House Republicans passed, one that calls for cuts in federal spending. He said the Senate's done nothing and the president is ignoring the problem. Russia launched a wave of missile attacks across Ukraine early today. The capital, city Kyiv, was hit the first time it's been struck in more than a month. Explosions were also heard in five other regions. At least 12 people were killed. Ukraine says it shot down 11 cruise missiles and two drones. The Bank of Japan scrapped its guidance on future interest rate levels at its first meeting under new governor Kazuo Ueda. Now, at the same time, it's keeping its main stimulus measures unchanged in pursuit of stronger inflation. And that keeps the BOJ in a very different place than other central banks who are fighting rising hikes. ExxonMobil posted its strongest ever start to a year. Net income more than doubled from a year earlier to $11.4 billion. That's the highest first quarter profit in Exxon's 140-year history. Meanwhile, Chevron also, also posted better than expected results. Profits from oil refining soared. Investors are watching to see if the oil super majors can sustain massive share buybacks and dividends despite slumping energy prices. And Amazon jolted investors with the talk of a slowdown in cloud computing growth. The company's most profitable division saw a 16% gain in revenue in the first quarter. That's the slowest growth rate since Amazon began breaking out of the unit sales. Amazon is the largest seller of rented computing power and software services. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. You know what happens with a compromise? We can get something together. It's what I sat down with the president the very beginning in February 1st. I said, Mr. President, why don't we sit down and work through it? There's two things I will not do, Mr. President. I will not raise taxes, and we will not pass a clean debt ceiling. But we can talk about everything else. 
House Speaker Kevin McCarthy with a big win this week with Republicans in the House speaking on Bloomberg's Balance of Power with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie. Fantastic exchange just yesterday. If you'd like to watch that in full, you can do on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg Terminal if you are a subscriber. Looking elsewhere at the market to close out the week, going into the weekend, your equity market unchanged through most of this week on the S&P 500, unlike the Nasdaq, which is positive, off the back of some decent earnings from the likes of Meta and Microsoft. Looking at the S&P this morning, negative zero. 0.4% on the S&P 500. Yields come in just a little bit. We're down by four basis points going into the Federal Reserve next week. 348 on a two-year. Just looking at the monthly moves on a two-year. The two-year pretty much flat on the month. But some big, big ranges once again. 364, 360-something at the low end. Yeah. Close to 430 at the high end. That two-year still this month, Tom. Stabilising a little bit over the last week, around 4%, but still... All over the place. The first thing I looked at this morning was that two-year yield. I will say, John, looking at Bloomberg Launchpad of equities, bonds, currencies, commodities, end of April into May, I'm looking at euro end in the Asia drama, 149.34. But I go where Liz Ann Saunders is of Charles Schwab, and this oddity, which Lisa's nailed, of short-term paper versus the 10-year note, it is an inversion. It, what would the 210 extrapolation be of that? Would it be 110, 120 basis points on 210? We got a, a, a substantial three-month 10-year inversion. Two-year 10-year right now, Tom, negative 57 basis points. And then you've got all these little kinks in the front end of the curve and T-bills. Going into Lisa, the debt quickly on the kinks. What do later? those kinks look like? You're expert on this. Well, at one point, uh, it was the biggest kink, basically, uh, three month yields, the highest relative to one month yields, going back to, I believe, 2001. <clears throat> and the thinking here was that that three month would really bump <clears throat> up against the debt ceiling debate. And that's why you were seeing a higher premium on those. Can bills. I just say, Seema Shaw's had more email response to an appearance <laughs> than anyone well, in the last 90 days. She's welcome back anytime. It's a belligerent interview, and we think. Her from the principal group for being with us. Right now, with the movement of April into May, that means that Washington is preparing for a hotter season. And if you get out the calendar, that can mean only one thing. This weekend, the White House Correspondents' Dinner, we will be honored to attend with our chief social correspondent for Washington, Anne Marie Horton. Anne Marie, there's a pomp and circumstance to it, there's different parties in that. But the reality is the president is greeted by the press, print, TV, radio, and the rest. They're greeting him after the oddity of an election announcement on video. How will the president be greeted this Saturday night? Well, you, you've been to these, of course, Tom, many a times. I actually think you're more of the social correspondent for Bloomberg Television. But listen, the president is obviously going to get the grilling from the comedian that will be there, um, as he did last year. Roy Wood Jr. Presidents, yeah. yes, and presidents before him have had. Um, but really, obviously, what the press is going to be looking for is, I think, how the president acts, what his speech entails. But he's not just now the U.S. president. He's also a candidate for 2024. Yeah. So there's a little bit of a different uh, lens that everyone will be watching him this weekend. What is the lens of the president for May? How does he advocate his candidacy without actually being overt and running? Well, he's just going to be acting as the commander in chief. He obviously domestically has a big battle ahead of him, which uh, from my conversation with Kevin McCarthy, the Speaker of the House, he is not backing down, wants to get the president in the room, wants to find a compromise. Um, but of course, the White House is saying that they want to separate anything that has to do with budget and spending cuts with a clean debt ceiling bill. That's what they want. And Speaker McCarthy says that is not going to happen. That's one of his, one of two of his demands. And then, of course, the president is going to be um, out on his foreign policy uh, talking points. He will be at the G7, and then he's going over to Australia for a quad meeting. Mm. Uh, this is a moment where he could show that the United States is leading when it comes to uh, places like China. This is, these are going to be two very big moments for the president. And, and in these kind of places, he's going to be acting like president, but he'll be on display as the candidate for the Democratic Party for 2024. Over the past 24 hours, you've been speaking extensively with analysts and people uh, in the Beltway about whether this Republican Republican agreement makes it harder or easier to come to some sort of compromise. What's your sense? Well, the Republicans will tell you that they're the only ones that have actually done something. This is what Kevin McCarthy's um, entire point is. He says the Senate hasn't done anything. The president hasn't done anything. We've actually passed 
a debt ceiling bill. It just has spending cuts in it. And for them, this is their opening salvo to really get in the door. The issue I think that many people are looking at, and I press Speaker McCarthy on this, is there's reporting that he said to his members, especially the Freedom Caucus members, that they are not going to get rid of the red meat of this bill when it comes to the compromises. Now, Punchbowl News is reporting that there was no such concessions made. And then Speaker McCarthy said yesterday the two things is he will just not raise taxes and he will not pass a clean debt ceiling bill. Everything else is up for negotiation. So I think what happens now is if there was to be a common sense compromise, this is what Senator Manchin is calling for and also urging the president to get in the room with the Speaker, if there was to be a common sense compromise, can Kevin McCarthy get Republicans behind that? What could happen is that it has to be passed in a bipartisan fashion. Democrats are going to have to sign up for it in the House. Anne Marie, we just had Seema Shah on, who told us that everyone outside of the U.S. doesn't care and has moved on from this. So let's move on That's just true. briefly. Uh, as we do deal with some other issues, there seems to be a shift in tone in the U.S. recently when it comes to China, where suddenly you have uh, Sel Sullivan, uh, Jake Sullivan, saying that the U.S. wants to de risk, not decouple from China. And uh, Trade Representative Catherine Tai calls it an economic <clears throat> misalignment and it needs to be right sized. Is there significance to this change in tone? I think what we've seen over the course of the past few weeks is that the U.S. wants to make sure that they are setting up a pathway to engage with China. There are a number of big issues they need to deal with with China when it comes to climate change, when it comes to making sure the militaries are talking to each other, when it comes to trying to get Xi Jinping to uh, properly engage when it comes to a peace agreement or ceasefire and that's going on in Ukraine, making sure that he is not sending a lethal or unlethal weapons that could be uh, material that could be used by the military. So the United States obviously wants this engagement. There also probably is a lot of concern that the U.S. is losing the global south, and Xi Jinping is potentially picking that up. Um, so there's been a lot of hot rhetoric, and it does seem like they're just trying to bring the temperature down. Just one final question from us, Anne-Marie. A little bit later on this morning, that report from the vice chair of supervision of the Federal Reserve on the failure of SVB, how important is that going to be for you and the team a little bit later? Well, it's incredibly important, but it comes at a time where we're trying to figure out what the U.S. government potentially will do or not do when it comes to First Republic. So obviously, there's going to be a post-mortem of SVB. At the same time, you have the House going after the um, San Francisco Fed. They have subpoena power um, in this committee, and they want to hear from Mary Daly over there. And then on top of that, we're also waiting on what's going to happen with First Republic. The reports that potentially there could be this private sector deal. It was just a month ago I was first one to report that Jamie Dimon sat with Treasury Secretary Yellen. Do we see a repeat of that? So it's an interesting time, I think, for this report to come out. See what happened with SVB while we await for the future of what happens with First Republic. AMH, thank you. Looking forward to your coverage with Joe Matthew a little bit later on on Balance of Power at 5 p.m. Eastern time. They'll be catching up with the former FDIC chairman, Bill Isaac. So that's going to be important conversation, Tom, on these issues. Lisa? Well, I'm just looking through uh, some of the reporting, Reuters reporting a couple of hours ago that the FDIC, the Treasury Department and others are getting together uh, some of the private sector uh, players to see if they can quickly negotiate some sort of deal. It seems like it's not going well because they're bringing in more and more players, whether it's private equity, whether it's direct lenders. A real question here, though, Elon still Musk. is, well, I don't know about that, but <laughs> the question still here is, are they going to participate in terms of some sort of guarantee backing this? I hate to pick on one individual and mention them by name because there have been so many failures all over the place. Yeah. Mary Daly really haven't heard much from the San Francisco Fed president whatsoever on this or issue, Tom. Or from the chairman. Or from the chairman I, himself, I agree. Fed Chair Jay Powell. I, I, I'm with you. And, and I think everyone knows I'm a huge fan of Mary Daly, but I've been thunderstruck by the silence. A lot of silence from the regulator and from First Republic themselves, I have to say, for the week so far. The equity market a little bit softer. Welcome to the program, live on TV and radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Your equity market negative on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're negative 0.2%. Amazon getting lots of attention for good reason. It was absolutely flying after the close yesterday, initially, when it reported results. And then it offered you a little bit of soft guidance around what the momentum looked like from Q1 into the beginning of Q2 on the cloud business, and maybe a little bit softer than anticipated. That stock took out pretty much all of the gains 
overnight. So that might weigh on the Nasdaq. Look out for that a little bit later on this morning. In the bond market, the two-year, the 10-year, the 30-year, we look like this. Yields come in a bit, down five basis points on a 10-year, 347. The curve flattening here, we're down two basis points on a two-year yield to 4.04%. Going into the Federal Reserve next week, looking for a 25 basis point hike and then what? Then what? Well, maybe then this. Morgan Stanley looking for the Fed to communicate what they call a conditional pause. Big conversation in the news conference, no doubt, about that with Chairman Powell next what week. What is a conditional pause? It means a pause which is conditional, Tom, on incoming information which might lead to cuts or hikes. Does that help you? <laughs> Instead of a committed pause into year-end, regardless of what the data looks like. He's loving it. Look at that. This drives him nuts. Yeah, is, no, it, is it conditional-ish? <laughs> the problem is, Tom, and this is a big issue with this Federal Reserve, they've explained what they would like to do implied by their projections. Do you trust them? I think that's the issue. And there are some people who believe that once inflation looks like it's got a three handle, they're just going to back away and maybe move away from the effort. I think people are getting bored with Fed prognostications oh, just think? simply because... I totally <laughs> agree. <laughs> <laughs> second, but partly because they have no inside knowledge. Maybe the senior loan officer survey could change that if it's, hey, we, we actually got a sneak peek and let me tell you it doesn't look good. We're not going to hike. You know, that would actually get some people's attention. But other than that... What guidance can they give? We want the event, don't we? <clears throat> Up front, all at once. Yes. Especially on a Sunday evening where you sit around and say, that's it, that's the future. We've decided. It's foretold. That's not how this stuff works. It's a process. It's going to take weeks, months, quarters to get this to information. I know. I know. Everyone wants everyone it. Feels. Up front. I know. Let's well, see the credit crunch now. <laughs> I think that's, that that's, that's not how yeah. it works. And if it doesn't happen, then people basically say, well, it's over, so now let's go buy. Well, what you are seeing in terms of buying and selling this morning, Amazon shares. And really, it's not necessarily that the action is so incredible. It's down 2.3 percent. It's why it's down and how big the swing has been. More than 14 percentage points up and then down after people found out that momentum had slipped, to use your phrase, John, uh, in the uh, in the second quarter. This question around cloud computing and how much their AWS is perhaps losing share or not at least gaining as much as some of the other cloud competitors. Pinterest, interesting to watch. And the bigger story with Pinterest and Snap to me is how much is Meta consolidating the market share when it comes to ad revenue and actually stand out rather than being uh, just simply riding the macro wave. Pinterest falling uh, significantly 14% after talking about a weak forecast, Snap also uh, missing expectations with revenue and seeing that to continue uh, going forward. Really interesting whether this divergence only widens as people really look to advertise only on the most dominant uh, places in Intel. This is interesting. This is about a very low bar, clearing it and just saying things might look OK. And then all of a sudden, those shares are up 6.3 percent. Just to give you a sense, though, those shares, John, were down about almost 50 percent last year. So off a pretty low base. But they're seeing some potential signs that they could see free cash flow that gets positive in the second half of the year. Can I just say I love how Silicon Valley executives speak, talk about issues. This is how Snap described the advertising oh, backdrop. No. Continued disruption and demand for advertising. What is a continued disruption and demand? Go, John, Why can't you just say demand was softer? I mean, what does that mean? Why does everything have to be disrupted? What is well, disruption? What is, because what, they took why, a, why, why, why they, they because they this? took a course in a fa let me answer this they took a course at a fancy school they were told to read Clay Christensen on d disruption but they never read the book that's why well it also implies <clears throat> that it will come back disrupted sure. not necessarily stalled out and that I think is the distinction but I could argue is it disrupted because Meta is grabbing your market share or is it disrupted because you know something oh. larger that's not going to come back it's a transitory soft patch. <laughs> <laughs> Conditional, sure. It's a conditional yeah, decline. It's a conditional decline. A conditional pause, Tom. If you live the, the study of reserves, disruption, sure. which many do, you do it at Babson College, and that is the land of the great, late, hugely missed Clay Christensen. Yuri and Timmer joins us of Babson, of Wellesley, and of Fidelity of Boston this morning with exquisite technical analysis on where we are. I'm just going to cut to the chase. Within your first five charts for FMR Co., you say we've been in a 10 months no man land. When do we know we're escaping up or down our 10 months no man's land? Yeah, so we all know how the cycle began, and we all want to know how the cycle will end. And will it end with uh, the Fed <clears throat> you know, raising rates one more time next week and then pausing, which I do think is a likely scenario because we know from history that the Fed raises rates to 
um, more or less at or above the inflation rate, uh, the trailing inflation rate. And so the core PCE is at 4.6, presumably on its way down, and the Fed is now near 5. And of course, the tips break evens are somewhere 2 to 2.5. Two so on, on that, by that measure, the Fed is well above the neutral rate, if you will. Um, so I think for the Fed, it's mostly a question of how quickly do they go back to neutral, which would be around 3%, and my guess is not, not very. Um, and then the other question is about the earnings front, right? So the market is pricing in uh, a, a modest uh, contraction in earnings. So there's your modest um, uh, mild recession you know, scenario, which I do think is likely second half of the year. But the market's very capable of looking through that, of course, um, as, it, as it always does. Um, and so on that, on that, by that measure, um, you know, we could see a 40% expansion in the multiple at some point. And the expansion at the bottom in October was 15. And so that gets you to 21 times next year's earnings of 225, 230, gets you back to the new highs. So that's the half, the glass half full scenario where the market deals with the Fed, deals with a modest slowdown or contraction in earnings, and then a recovery. And obviously, the big question is, how good are those earnings forecasts? We know that the consensus numbers tend to be optimistic, and so far the numbers for this quarter have been okay. Um, but that that becomes really the the main question. But if you look at the internals, right, the S and P 500 equal weighted index has gone nowhere in 10 months. Uh, the small caps are at the lows, micro caps are at new lows. But the mega caps are at recovery highs, and so the market has been all over the place. And this, you know, these trading ranges now ten months old. And back in 2015, it was from August 14 to February 16. 94 was a trading range. So if a trading range is all we're going to get, uh, you know, after all of this craziness of the last three years, you know, little bubbles because of financial repression and then a massive rate reset, then. I'll take that as a win. But the earnings need to, you know, the market can look past an earnings valley, but it can't look past an earnings abyss. And so that really is what it comes down to. Lost decades aren't unusual. We've seen them through history and recent yep. history as well. You can look to Japan as an example of that and other areas as well. European banks for much of 10 years did basically nothing. You're in, when you look at the US equity market after what many people consider to be a bubble that's burst, do you see the potential for a lost decade in equity market returns at the index level in this country? Well, we had one, of course, in the 2000s, the 70s, the 30s, and, and 40s. Uh, you know, I call them secular bear markets. And secular bull markets tend to last about 18 years, produce about an 18% rate of growth. And secular bear markets tend to last about 14 years and produce basically zero growth or negative real growth. And so one of the big questions is, is has the secular bull market that I think started in 09, has it ended? And uh, they, it would be a shorter than usual one, uh, although the one from 1921 to 29 was very short and extremely powerful. So when you look at valuations and you look at you know the new inflation regime, assuming for a moment that it's going to be above the Fed's uh, target zone, <clears throat> and you look at interest rates possibly having made secular lows, uh, that would argue for a, a more modest valuation regime, which would go in line with kind of the a secular bear market. But um, but you know to call it another lost decade, I, I'm not prepared to you know to go there yet. Um, a lot of that does come down to financial engineering and you know converting earnings into share buybacks. So that's been an extremely powerful engine, um, as well as M&A, right? If you go back to the end of the financial crisis and you look at the supply and demand of shares by corporates themselves, IPOs and secondaries, about two and a half trillion of supply. M&A and buybacks, which is the retirement of shares from corporates, about eight times as high. Uh, so it's been a massive imbalance of the supply of shares and the demand for shares, not even counting end investors. This is just the corporates. So if that, <clears throat> if that engine keeps going, then I think the bull market stays alive. But if, if a higher rate or a tighter Fed um, regime kind of you know, slows down that train, then I think there's, a, there's, there's reason to think that it could be otherwise. Just quickly, is a 60-40 portfolio going to work in a higher inflation environment with slower growth? So I, I've looked at this going back 150 years. And um, <clears throat> when the inflation rate trends 
or is sustained above the historical average, which is 3 percent, then the 60-40 doesn't work. The 40 does not, is then positively correlated to the 60. Um, so the question is, you know, we were at about a 2 percent regime. We're now at about 2.5 if you look on a 10-year rate of change basis. Um, so it really comes down to whether the inflation situation remains structural or, or transitory, uh, you know, and it's interesting. <clears throat> I just did a, a deep dive on the 1940s. Uh, I read the history of the Federal Reserve by Ellen Meltzer, and you know they had 20 percent inflation in 46 and 47 when the price controls were lifted, um, and at the same time the monetary growth right. started to reverse, and so it really was transitory back then. And you know the kind of the post-COVID pent-up demand versus the post-war. Yeah. There are some similarities. There's there. some similarities there. And then we got to deflation, Eisenhower's true deflation of 52, 53. And then, John, that gets you to 2 to 3 percent interest rates right now. Do you predict a follow on de disinflation, deflation? Well, I mean, the monetary base or the money supply numbers are <clears throat> have rolled over, uh, which is what they did in the second half yep. of the 40s after obviously expanding you know, rapidly from 42 to 46. And then once the price controls were lifted, you had a one time price shock. And so, Hopefully, this was a one-time price shock, and if so, then the inflation averages go back to kind of the, the historical average, and then 60-40 continues to work. And, you know, the 40 this year is sort of doing what it's supposed to be doing, so. This was a clinic, it was. Tom Keane. This a is clinic. what you get from Urien Timmer. Urien, thank you. It's yeah. going to see you in New York, too. Urien Timmer there <clears throat> of Fidelity Investments. Your equity market negative 0.3% on the S&P 500 at 8.30 Eastern time. That's about 50 minutes from now. Nita Richardson of ADP reacting to this morning's economic data. Keeping you up to date with the news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Speaker Kevin McCarthy is putting the pressure on President Biden and Democrats to embrace his plan that was passed on the House floor in order to avoid a debt limit crisis. In an interview with Bloomberg TV, he said the president is putting the economy at risk by avoiding a negotiation. Biden opposes the measure because it includes sweeping spending cuts in order to raise the debt ceiling. In China, the Communist Party's Politburo said the country's economic recovery needs continued fiscal and monetary support. It also warned that domestic demand is insufficient. The Politburo is the top decision-making body led by President Xi Jinping. It's another sign of improving relations between the UK and EU after years of acrimony over Brexit. Now, Bloomberg's learned that the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, is planning to attend an upcoming meeting of European finance ministers. Lazard posted a surprise loss in the first quarter and warned that layoffs are on the way. The asset manager says it will cut about 10 percent of its workforce. As of the end of 2022, Lazard had a little more than 3,400 employees. The firm blames its performance on slow M&A activity. And in sports, Lamar Jackson has become the highest paid player ever in the National Football League. According to multiple reports, the Baltimore Ravens quarterback has agreed to a five-year, $260 million deal with $185 million of that guaranteed. Jackson negotiated the deal on his own without an agent. Gotta love that. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. been a problem for Amazon the last couple of years. Last year they had $12 billion of free cash outflow. Um, and really there's three things driving that. One is obviously weak profits. Um, and so we're starting to see some improvement in operating profit coming through, but it's very slow. Um, but you know, inflation headwinds should ease. That was Stefan Stowinski, the global software analyst at BNP Paribas, a little bit earlier on this morning, following numbers out of Amazon to wrap up big tech for the week at least and push ahead to Apple next week. Amazon came out with what looked like 
decent numbers. The stock rallied hard after the close yesterday in the post market and then all of a sudden rolled over as they signalled a loss of momentum coming into Q2 and maybe a softer April for the cloud business. Amazon down by about 2.4% right now the last of the big tech players tom to report this week and the guidance <clears throat> not great let's put it that way if you can call what we heard yesterday guidance yeah i looked at joe feldman over at telsey advisory group and his his not caution but he pulled back as lisa said up 12 uh what was it 12 percent they were up it's a big move yeah negative two percent and joe feldman had that tinge in his note as well it was about the cardboard boxes we all get at our door, but it was about, as a general statement, a halving of the growth rate on cloud. A softer April, maybe, continuing into May, June, who knows? Well, that's the granular, but what's the longer term view is maybe more uh, where we where we want to be on this. Uh, right now with this Anurag Rana, senior technology analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence with massive street cred on the cloud as well. What's the number one thing people, financial talking heads with bow ties get wrong about the cloud. What is it, you know, we all sit the cloud and this, and what, what do we get wrong? So it, it is the next wave of however you're going to build applications. It's just a very simple way of saying that, you know, that is the Ferrari where everything is going to run later on. Now, the question is, do you, are you investing in that right now? Or are you going to wait a little bit? Now, you know, we talked about growth rates. Going into the quarter, they said they will do 14% uh, in Amazon in constant currency, and the next quarter consensus figures were 12%. They did 16 and guided to 11, and that's what really caused a big mess. And, you know, we've been saying for a while that part of the magic of cloud is that your cost structure becomes variable compared to a fixed cost structure as an enterprise, and that is another big driver, uh, growth driver in the long run. So talk to me a little bit more about that. Are you saying that basically these companies don't have much clarity about the future and the way that they used to? Is that is that how you'd explain it? Yeah, the Amazon businesses, yes. But that's the question is, yeah, we don't have that much clarity over the next six months. I have a very good clarity for the next five years. I, I'd have no problem, you know, sticking my neck out and says, this business over the next five to six years will double from where it is today. I, I, I'm i very confident in that, that, that statement because majority of tech spending, over $2 trillion of that, still resides on large companies and their internal data centers. That's where bulk of the applications are. And that's where the big movement is. And again, you can't run generative AI on older infrastructure. So this is as an industry group. But what about the specific sectors? What about spe the specific players? And I think about Microsoft delivering better than expected web proje uh, cloud projections, as well as what we saw from Google. Uh, Alphabet also saw profits for the first time from their cloud services. So how much is this an Amazon-specific story versus a broader, even six-month uh, story? Amazon has over 40% market share in infrastructure, cloud infrastructure. Nobody else cl comes close to it. Even Microsoft and Google are far behind. Now, they have been closing the gap over the years. And for Microsoft, they have been closing the gap from their legacy businesses, companies that have been around for a while and that use Microsoft products in their own data centers. They, they moving their own workloads to the cloud is what's driving their business. But frankly speaking, Amazon has not been losing market share at least for the past five, six years. When, it, when you look to just the next six months, the idea of companies maybe not investing as much in their infrastructure, in their tech, how broad does that go? Who else does that affect? It affects the entire software schema. It entires the entire IT services schema, entire the entire hardware area, because what's happening right now is people are saying, I cannot spend at that same rate that I was in the last five to six years. I want to look at Cloudflare. Uh, I got, you know, Matthew Prince is uh, the one that's made that wonderful firm go. It's something we never talk about. They're getting hammered this morning uh, is, is, is well. What is the symbol from the tangential companies around these big names we talk to yeah. if I see Cloudflare flare out? Yeah, you should see like somebody like a Snowflake also get hurt today, Datadog, MongoDB, all these companies that really bounced back very strongly in the last four, just two days. So, you know, if Amazon would have reported before Microsoft, things wouldn't have been sounded that badly. I think the expectations really rose very high after Microsoft. Well, so does it load the boat time? I mean, you've got this three and five year wisdom here. Are you saying, are you saying cloud with a carnage this morning is a massive overweight? So the question is, how, what is your time horizon? If your time horizon is the next six months, like most investment firms, then you got to just <clears> hold back. But if you have a three to five year horizon, you should be looking at it. Can we finish on a topic we touched on a little bit earlier? And I think we'd love your view on it. How did the guy that decided to sell books online 
eat IBM's lunch. How did that happen? Oh, it's, it's one of the most phenomenal stories. I would uh, urge all of you to read Brad Stone's book on it. It is, you know, he basically said, I want a computer uh, with infinite computing power. They said, well, how many data centers do you want? He says, infinity. He says, what does that mean? He says, I need more and more capacity. So we're going to have a very large computer where most of the world will do their computing services. It will be like a utility business. There are no companies that generate their own electricity. Companies should not be running their own data centers too. What was it about Amazon that led to that moment? What was it about the nature of the business that led to that moment in a way that it didn't happen <clears throat> at companies like IBM in quite the same way? Because the scale they wanted for their retail business, online business, was not available with the older tools. They needed to do it in-house. Everything needed to talk to each other very rapidly, whether it was the server, the software, the networking equipment. And they said, we will just build it in-house and we will use open source software to create it. Just amazing, Tom, how this story happened. Just oh, absolutely yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, and Anurag mentioned this briefly, but folks, a definitive book on this is Brad Stone. You don't see him on surveillance. He's a rock star out on the West Coast. You well, know, he's still in bed. Just, he's still, they just, As he should he, be. He, German, the rest of them, they don't even want to talk to us. It's like we don't exist. Anurag, you know? does the cloud business exist at IBM? The answer to that is, yeah, kind of. But what's happening with it? But it's a different business for them. So initially, they wanted to compete head-on with you know the likes of Amazon and Microsoft, but once they figured out it's not going to work, I think the new CEO did a very good job by acquiring Red Hat. So what was going to happen, let's say for a company, I'm, I'm just going to make up, let's say PepsiCo. They've been investing in technology for the past 20, 30, 40 years. They have a very massive on-premise footprint. They need to move to the cloud. And their strategy is going to be, I'm going to keep some workloads on the cloud. I'm going to keep some in-house. And that's why Red Hat, along with IBM, has this hybrid cloud strategy where you can have an infrastructure that would work on any cloud on the background, but my applications can run you know, seamlessly in both places. And that's their business model now. So these secular tailwinds that we talked about for a long time, you don't think it's over? Oh no, not not even close to it. I mean, we just saw, we just saw the biggest next, you know, you could say big growth driver in technology. That's all AI enabled, you know, applications. They they run at a speed you can't even think of. You need processing power of the cloud to run that. The current footprint is we are. I, in my view, less than 20, 25% penetrated in the cloud. We have a long way to go. You sound incredibly bullish. Just to go back to something you said about understanding, have a better understanding of the next five years and the next six months. You're basically saying any cyclical headwinds that affect cloud spend in these companies, ignore them. Is that, is that the message? Not, not for the six months. I think things could get very tough. And I, and I think, you know, uh, Tom asked me this two weeks ago, what's my view on cloud? I said, very negative going into, you know, these, this earnings season. I was proven wrong with Microsoft. But last night, you know, we are, you know, on, on point that this thing is going to continue to have really massive pressures because companies are not spending on cloud. Just amazing. You've got to come back and talk to us about AI. That's, you know, it's tangential to what I do. I mean, I really don't care. But, boy, is there a debate about AI well, right now? Well, I think now. we're all going to care. Huge debate. Pretty quickly, just yeah, to be clear. But, I think know, we're all going to care. He's going to, he's going to steer, us cl uh, steer us straight. Anurag, this right was now. fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Anurag Rana there of Bloomberg you know, Intelligence on Amazon and the cloud business, Tom. Can I get tearful here? You know, it's the end of April. We're into May. We are so lucky to go from Yuri and Timmer to Anurag Rana. It's just sick, the quality of Are they of like tears of joy? Well, I don't know. Are Anna Raga may not be, but, you know, I mean, you know, Seema Shaw to Yuri and Timmer. She was belligerent. Anna Rana, you know. Can you, say, Shaw was can you say President Biden is belligerent so we can get good emails for you? Like no, you no, 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 You're not going to go there. No, okay. thanks. Sebastian Page coming up <laughs> in about five minutes' time. We're going to catch up with him from T. Rowe Price and wrap up these tech earnings for you. A little bit more on Amazon. Push ahead to Apple. And two big central banking decisions on deck next week. The Federal Reserve on Wednesday, on May 3rd. On May 4th, the ECB, the European Central Bank decision. If that's not enough for you, payrolls Friday just around the corner. I really don't know what happened to the month of April, May, just a few days away. Your equity market negative 0.4% on the S&P 500. Yields come in three or four basis points on a 10 year, sub 350. And in the FX market, the euro, a break of 110. Euro dollar 109.76, we're negative there 0.5%. From New York, this is Bloomberg. My head is spinning. It's a it's a tough environment. The markets are never clear. I'm disappointed that full year estimates 
for the S&P 500 are not going up after all this good news. The economy is still proving resilient. It is hard to say that the economy is not still expanding. If you look around the economy today, it looks fairly strong. Yes, there's a soft snow like slowdown happening, but generally speaking, things look okay. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom Keen. It is the end of April. We're going to go into May, figure out if we buy in May, sell in May. We don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to do it with an environment of slower American inflation. At least that's the theme. John, moments ago, the massive dichotomy between Europe and us, the German inflation numbers, we were the cueing the music up and we're hearing from Bob Dahl, and I'm looking at those German inflation numbers going, I'm sorry, that's got to be something about the conversation of May. Well, relative to expectations, it's a downside surprise, but, but at the end of the day, it's a problem. It's still got a seven handle, 7.6%. <clears throat> year over year, month over month, 0.6%. Going into the ECB next week, SOC Gen say 50, 50 basis points from the European Central Bank just around the corner again. And I'm going to suggest, John, with all the distractions of April, including First Republic Bank gyrating around now, 6.19 is a last uh, a print. I'm, we've, got, we've taken our eye off the inflation discussion, is what I would suggest, in April. Because we've become obsessed with the growth discussion yeah. in a much bigger way. And this idea that maybe we've lost some momentum from Q1 into Q2, and you can see it across <clears> the board. I'll go through some of the banks. City are basically saying they think in June that we're going to get upgrades to the forecast from the Federal Reserve on growth, on inflation. I have to say everything else I've read says anything, but Bank of America expect momentum in the economy to slow in 2Q. BNP anticipate a recession <clears throat> in the second half of 23. Morgan Stanley expect to see significant right. slowing in 2Q23. Amazon, Tom, Q1 into Q2, looking for that slowdown uh, as well. Lisa, you've nailed that this week with the coloring of the earnings uh, announcement. Lisa, give me your view on the Fed because I've moved beyond May 3rd. I mean, we're going to do special programming on May 3rd. We all love that 18-hour day. But the reality is I'm out to June 14th right now. I'm out beyond that, honestly. And when you say that we're not focusing on inflation, I think that's the right question. Is whatever we're seeing in the economy enough to bring down inflation? Is still this idea of immaculate disinflation kind of percolating behind the scenes as people see stronger than expected economic performance and yet ongoing uh, declines, which is just logical year over year in inflation? And this is really the tension. If that higher than expected growth leads to <clears throat> higher than expected inflation. What does the Fed do if growth is still slowing? John, 4.07% on a two-year yield. I mean, I guess it's not a high-value thing. I need a bigger number. But the answer is the yield gyration off of a week's activity is to a higher yield structure, lower prices. Unemployment is 3.5% in the United States of America. If you want a date on the calendar, let's just pick a random <clears throat> one. Let's say end of August, Jackson Hole. Chairman Powell's sitting down. He's going to do a speech. And we're going to get the opportunity to compare and contrast the speech he'll deliver then with the speech he delivered 12 months prior, 12 months previously, where he talked about pain that we'd have to go through. I wonder where the unemployment rate is 12 months later when he sits in Jackson Hole again, Lisa, reflecting on the pain that apparently he was <coughs> going to cause 12 months previously. How much pain will there be that we've experienced between now and August when he delivers his next speech based, from there. Based on what we saw yesterday with initial jobless claims, not that much. You're not going to necessarily creep up in a meaningful way, which then raises this question, is it enough to get to where they want to go? If we haven't seen the pain, can we get a painless disinflation, or is this going to require something because more? Because that's what it's all about. If inflation is going to come down, we go back to the question of the last 12 months. What's the price we've got to pay for it in GDP? In oh, unemployment. Yeah, yeah, I, I will go with that theme, but I'm still thunderstruck by European inflation. And I, you know, I get that inflation here is going to come down, and there's some very good already reading for the weekend on that. Down to what, John? Three or four percent inflation is not acceptable in most of the textbooks that I've ever read. I'm shocked that they've gone as far as they have done at the ECB. A couple of years ago, I think we were I having agree. a conversation about whether they get above zero. <clears throat> ever again at the European Central Bank. And here we are about to go through four. Tom, about to go through four 
at the yeah. ECB. And I, and it go, they're going up, and their inflation rate still seems to be sustained. We'll have much more on that into May as well. John, quickly on the data here, I'm going to go right back to where I was, 4.06% on a two-year yield. A negative 0.4% on the S&P 500, just a little bit <coughs> softer, no real drama here. Just to reflect on a bond market, just to touch base with what's happening with Treasuries. Yields down four basis points. It's a break of 350 again, 348 on a 10-year. On a two-year, the two-year... North of 4% again after the moves yesterday. I think jobless claims helping to move that one along a little bit more. And the underlying GDP read, the <clears> consumption was still strong. That's one view. There's another view out there that things are starting to fade and fade quickly elsewhere. The two-year this morning, Tom, 4.06%. Right now, we're going to get a summer here out of April and into May. And, of course, the cliche is sell in May and, and go away. T. Rowe Price does not have that luxury. They have to play in the market 24-7. He is global multi-asset head for uh, the Baltimore shop. Sebastian Page, good morning, good morning. I just really want to go to one of your subheads where you talk about the zombie fear that's out there. I would suggest, and it's my theme for the year, the great zombie roll-up is a constructive exercise. When rates come up, things happen with companies and you get combinations that can be of benefit. Tom, I'm great. I'm, I'm glad you bring this up. I bring a special topic to my asset allocation committee every month, and the last one was the zombies, and I was inspired by you because I know you talk a lot about the great zombie roll-up. There's a scary chart going around on social media that shows that 20 or even 24 percent of all companies in the Russell 3000 don't generate enough net revenues to cover their interest rate payments, their debt payments. That is a remarkably scary chart because it shows an all-time high. So people are talking of the zombie apocalypse. The posts are in all caps. So I decided to dig into this for my asset allocation committee. And there's massive, massive caveats to add to this. And I noticed a bit of grump grumpiness on the show this morning. And so I want, I want to put the caveats out there for the zombies, OK? First of all, most of them are micro caps. Second, really important, Tom, the revenues generated might be lower than the debt payments, but there are at least three reasons why zombies might, so-called zombies, might still be good companies, right? The sales might be growing really fast, so they'll make up for it over time. Think of a company who's growing market share, number one. Number two, they might have innovation in the pipeline. Some of those are biotech companies, uh, meaning future cash flows can jump pretty quickly. And number three, they might have a lot of cash reserves. So here's what we did. We looked at actual probability of default, looking at balance sheet, looking at sales, looking at something called the Altman Z-score, which is an actual sort of predictive probability of default, adjusted for market cap, Tom the punchline. We went from 24% zombies, the world's falling apart, to 8.8%, actually closer to a historical bottom than closer to a historical top. So I thought I'd bring this up since there was a bit of grumpiness today. Well, thank you for that. I feel like it's relieved all of us this from our grumpiness. Grumpy. Well, I would say that it's been a long, long couple of months, and I don't think it's just us. It's what we hear reflected by everyone. And, Sebastian, you talk about how it's very hard to be uh, a bear at this point, given some of the gyrations, and yet you continue to be somewhat bearish. I just wonder how much you're considering growth continuing to remain steady, not decline all that much, inflation remaining steady, what do you do with that? You know, I think that's a plausible scenario, and that's why we're invested and we're modestly underweight stocks. It's not a let's go all to cash type of strategy. We don't do that anyways. And we're actually adding risk back in the portfolio by modestly also overweighting quality small caps and high yield. So from a risk posture, I think it's, it's boring for TV, but it makes sense to be neutral from a total risk posture. I do think stocks are expensive, and you hear it on your show all the time. All the traditional indicators are flashing red. LEIs, leading indicators, red. PMIs, down 17 points, flashing red. The yield curve, massively inverted, flashing red. Credit is tightening. Loan volumes down 18 percent. That's flashing red. I mean, look, the bearish narrative is really compelling. The only thing I would say and why it's not a time to panic and why I think, Lisa, your question is a good one, is that we're 
This is a cycle where we're unwinding massive COVID distortions, right? Liquidity is coming out. LEIs are flashing red. Housing is coming down. PMIs are coming down. But they're all coming down from a massive post-COVID pop. So we're looking at year-over-year -year data. I'm, I'm telling my team, stop looking at year-over-year -year data. You have to zoom out and realize that all these economic indicators went way up. M2 money supply, crazy. And then they're coming down. So it's a normalization, and we, it's just a different playbook. What are we normalizing to? The pre-pandemic trend line? What is it? I don't think we're normalizing all the way back to pre-pandemic. But if you just think of liquidity, right, it's worrisome that liquidity is coming out. It's definitely worrisome that we have to wait for the lag effects of 475 basis points of Fed hikes. But um, we have five trillion extra deposits in the banking system versus 2019. So we're not, you know, the normalization, I don't think, is going back to zero rates and the same sort of environment. I think we have a higher inflation volatility. I think we do have higher rates, ultimately higher real rates. And uh, it is, Jonathan, I think a regime shift. I mean, from 40 years of declining rates to finally a, a higher high in rates means a different, not just tactical, but strategic long-term portfolio construction playbook. Could we come to the investment committee meeting one day? We'd love to do that. Wouldn't that be great, Tom? It's fun. I love doing That'd it. I've had the cool. honor of doing that with a number of different firms. And the, the, T. Rowe Price, I mean, they own technology. They own some serious analysis. Seb, can we make that happen? I think he's gone. He or gone? else he's, he's just going to be... How uh, rude. Uh, no, I think that that's... How a... rude. Did they cut his microphone or is he gone, gone? <laughs> is he gone, gone? That's so bad. Know, maybe. Is that a no? I don't know. How I'm are you asking I'm kind of offended. How am I going to have a... Is that yeah, a I shutdown from T. Rowe Price? I don't think that he's shutting us out. Although not to go. Maybe we're too grumpy this morning and I count myself in that too. He was belligerent. I can't... But I'm going to say they cut his mic. They cut his I'm mic. going to say they did. They, yes. did. they cut his mic? Yes. We or love he, you. Come he, back anytime, did he, Sebastian. Did he just drop the headset and walk away? <laughs> like they're dreadful. OK. I might go too. And Rita Sen of Energy Aspects joins us next. I think that was a no. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy stepped up his demands for President Biden and Democrats to avoid a debt ceiling crisis. McCarthy told Bloomberg TV they should embrace the plan that House Republicans passed. He said he's willing to make a deal. You know what happens with a compromise? We can get something together. It's what I sat down with the president the very beginning in February 1st. I said, Mr. President, why don't we sit down and work through it? There's two things I will not do, Mr. President. I will not raise taxes, and we will not pass a clean debt ceiling. But we can talk about everything else. The president has rejected the idea of a debt limit bill that also cuts spending. Well, Russia has launched a wave of aerial attacks across Ukraine early today. The capital city, Kyiv, was hit the first time it's been struck in more than a month. Explosions were also heard in five other regions. Ukraine says it shot down 11 cruise missiles and two drones. ExxonMobil posted its strongest ever start to a year. Net income more than doubled from a year earlier to $11.4 billion. Now, that's the highest first quarter profit in Exxon's 140-year history. Meanwhile, Chevron also posted better than expected results. Profits from oil refining soared. Investors are watching to see if the oil super majors can sustain massive share buybacks and dividends despite slumping energy prices. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. The economy is still proving resilient despite the fact that the Fed is engaged in a very aggressive upward pathway to tame inflation. Broadly speaking, businesses are anticipating a slowdown in the economy. They're anticipating a recession to come in the second half of the year, and they responded in kind across the first three months of the year. Still trying to track down Sebastian Page at T. Rowe Price when we get hold of him. I'll let you know what the answer was to that question. Lindsay Piexa. The chief economist is Steve for there, wanging on this economy. A bit more data for you in about 13 minutes. The ECI, Employment Cost Index. Mike McKee logged into the Bloomberg, ready to go to break that down for you before we get there. Here's a snapshot of things for you at the moment. Equities negative 0.3%. Going into the weekend, with a week so far through Thursday, 
giving you an equity market that's pretty much flat on the S&P 500, positive about a 1% on the Nasdaq 100, about a quarter of the index, of course, reporting across three names on the Nasdaq 100. You know those three names, Microsoft, Meta, Amazon. It looked like Amazon was going to join the likes of Meta and Microsoft crushing it and then offer just some softer guidance around the month of April and going forward through 2Q. That stock is negative almost 3% now, Tom, which is amazing considering when that was around 4, 5 p.m., yesterday. That's the Amazon dynamic. I'm looking at First Republic Bank as well, maybe a bit off the surveillance radar, but should not be. Are we waiting for a Friday announcement? Don't you make these announcements at 5 p.m. on Friday? I think so. A weekend shocker? I don't know what that's it would be. When, that's we know PR what the options 101. are. We know what the options are. <clears throat> Let's see what they choose to do. Yeah, we'll have to see. And we're going to finish strong here over the next 45 minutes into the 9 o'clock hour. You have Dr. Larian joining you? We do in this about is a good thing. 40 minutes. Looking forward to it. Right now, Dr. Sen's going to join us. I'm Rita Sen. Really been looking forward to this, really on the microeconomics of oil. And you're shocked that it is near 60, $69 a barrel on West Texas Intermediate, 75.06 on American oil right now. And Rita, what does the general equilibrium dynamics of oil look right now? Right now? and can it nudge oil to a $69 handle? If you get a, uh, oh, just not one, but if you get a few really poor macroeconomic uh, data points that starts to spook the market a lot, yeah, look, we don't go to rule anything out. I mean, right now what's been fascinating is that crude prices have been the most correlated with bond vol. You should have a look at a chart, just correlation, very high R squared there as well. A bond volatility has spiked this week, and that's been one of the big sellers or big reasons why crude has sold off huge amounts of CTA selling as well. You know what, Tom, that fascinates me right now. I've rarely seen a market where we are drawing stocks. Fundamentals are actually tightening quicker than even we had expected, and yet the market right. isn't paying any attention to it, and it doesn't even believe in it. That's it's cr fascinating. critical. This is a critical observation, folks, and what Energy Aspects is so well known for. The market is tightening up. Why isn't price going to where so many people suggest it should go higher? For me, you know, a big chunk of what's been going on in terms of the day-to-day -day trading uh, is just the fact that people or investors, for instance, or traders just don't have enough capital. We have seen a lot of funds uh, take a lot, big hits, uh, big losses this year when we had prices dip to, say, Brent went down to $70 in early March uh, because of the macro fears. Then we had it kind of coming back up. We had the surprise OPEC cuts. What ended up happening is that the rally back up was so quick, a lot of them then ended up buying at the highs. So, and they're still down a lot on the year. This is isn't necessarily about fundamentals. It's just the lack of capital right now. We just don't have enough liquidity. And that's why the CTA moves are basically aggravating the day-to-day -day price volatility. Back in the real world, Exxon and Chevron just crushed it. They uh, delivered profits that we haven't really seen since oil was more than $145 a barrel. This, according to Kevin Crowley, over in Bloomberg mm -hmm. News, has been crunching the numbers after getting uh, the results. What do you make of that? The incredible profitability, despite the decline that we've seen in crude. <laughs> Again, a big chunk of their um, profitability came from refining margins. Refined products have been very, very strong, a sign that demand, despite all the Fed tightening overall, continues to hold up very well. Of course, this was last year, um, and we have seen refining margins come off this year, as expected, because we are adding at least net 1.5 million barrels per day of refining capacity. Uh, but I think the downstream sector has really helped energy majors across the board. Uh, and that's something we're not going to see that this year because of margins. But overall, I am still expecting decent results from the majors uh, even through 2023. How challenging is that politically when you have oil prices that are starting to creep back up, gasoline prices starting to creep back up in the United States, and you have this real urgency, especially as people try to combat inflation to keep prices low? How problematic is it that the margins are getting fatter for some of the refiners. So this year, uh, or right, let's say right now, prices are pretty low, right, where we are, whether it be WTI, Brent, or even uh, outright gasoline prices. I really don't think energy should even be talked about when we're talking about inflation right now. 
going into the summer, if our expectations are correct and crude prices go up and gasoline prices go up, then yes, we can start talking about it. Uh, but we're still going to be quite a bit lower year on year till probably the back half of the year. So I'm really like I know there's a lot of focus still on inflation and rightly so because inflation still remains relatively high. But it hasn't been oil that's been the driver, at least in the last few months. Amrita, thank you. Amrita Sen there of energy aspects on crude. Right now, 79 on Brent. WTI looks like this, 75. Both firmer by somewhere between half of 1% and 0.8% this morning. In about seven minutes, economic data in America, employment cost index, PCE, all that good stuff. Mike McKee with us around the table. Morning, Mike. Good morning. It's going to be fun. It will be fun for some people. For some um, people. If you're a nerd, people. yeah. Yeah, maybe. Uh, the Federal Reserve, <laughs> how will they look at this data going into next week? Well, it's probably too late for any of the data to really surprise them and make a, a difference in what they're going to do. Uh, we've already seen enough inflation data that suggests that inflation is still a problem. It hasn't gone down enough. And uh, we're not seeing a, a <clears throat> lot of strength out of consumers. So at this point, they can raise their 25 basis points. And then the question is, do they want to hold? And maybe... <clears throat> There's a little bit in here about whether they want right. to hold if the consumer spending numbers are, are bad or the uh, income numbers are weak. But uh, they're probably on track. It's what happens next that matters. In this weekend, we're going to have the PC deflator year over year, 4.1 percent is the survey. That says to me nominal GDP of five, dare I say, six percent as well. That's completely unacceptable to the Fed. How do you envision the path from 4.1 percent PCE deflator year over year down under 3%. Is that like you've got that staked out for this year, May into July into September? Or is it a Michael McKean mystery? <laughs> it, it's not a mystery, but we uh, we don't have a good timeline on it. We are expecting okay. PCE and CPI to go down because we're expecting rents to start to pull back. And that should slow down the overall level of inflation and have an impact on the core. Just a question of when they really start to hit. But that's what the Fed's counting on to get down to 3%. I keep going back to what you pointed out yesterday, which was that business investment was really curtailed in the first quarter, and yet they're finding they need to invest more. Could that add to a surprise pop in inflation? It could, in the sense that uh, if there's a shortage of supply and demand continues strong, but demand did fall off, uh, we saw in the latter months of the first quarter, we'll get a better picture of uh, March today. But if that's the case, then we've got a chicken and egg. <laughs> is it business falling off because consumers are, are pulling back or are consumers pulling back because business is falling off? That's a good point. Mike, you're going to break down the number in about five minutes' time and then we'll catch up with Mike McKee in the next hour to talk about the report that's going to come out a little bit later from the Vice Chair of Supervision at the Federal Reserve. Mr Michael Barr is going to break down the failure of SVB and maybe highlight some of the regulatory failures at the Federal Reserve. So that's a conversation for later. In the next hour on Bloomberg TV, fantastic lineup for you in the open. Mohammed Al Arian of Queen's College, Cambridge, Lindsay Rosner of Pigeon Fixed Income, Ashok Batia of Newburger Berman, and Michael Northen, Morton of Moffitt Nathanson on the latest numbers from Amazon. Tom, all of that coming up in the next hour. It's going to be interesting to see in this economic data. We've underplayed it this morning with the huge news flow we got, but it's a Seattle slew of data coming out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I got nine data points at That's 8 That's a lot. Follows yeah. Europe. Europe. Growth in Germany <clears throat> softer than expected. Inflation lower than expected. A rally in that bond market. Let's see what we've got in store for you in the U.S. Up next. Bloomberg surveillance end of April into May. Futures in negative 13. Dow futures in negative 115. The VIX not giving me much. 17.17. Lisa Abramowitz, John Farrow, and Tom Keen looking at a two year yield. Keep score 4.07%. As we look at economic data, we span the globe from the employment cost index. I'm down to the PCE core deflator. Why, oh, why? Who else can do it? Michael McKee. Yeah. Well, it sounds like the wide world of sports here. Employment cost <clears throat> index comes in a little bit hotter than anticipated. 1.2% for the first quarter. The expectation was for 1.1%. And uh, the... Um, 
uh, prior release uh, was 1%. So we are seeing a little bit of a rise in the employment cost index. Uh, wages and salaries in the ECI up 1.2%. Benefit costs up 1.2%. On a year-over-year basis, compensation for uh, civilian workers up 4.8% and wages up 5%. So we are wow. getting still some benefits to Americans. Now we're looking at personal income, which is uh, important to a lot of people, and we haven't got the uh, completely updated numbers yet, the internet being slow today. Uh, but we do know that personal income was up three tenths. That's the headline number uh, for the month of March. We'll see uh, as soon as I can get this thing to work what we'll get uh, from the overall. Um, numbers. Let's and wait for the numbers right we'll now, Michael. We got down. some yeah. computer oddities here, which we get here as well. Explain why e e employment cost index is so important. I agree well, with you. It's, it's important. It, it does. It uh, accounts for the fact that um, people change jobs and people stay in the same jobs, and uh, it's go. not just average hourly earnings. It is uh, more comprehensive in terms of the overall compensation numbers. The problem that you have is that it's only quarterly, so people still watch all of the other numbers. But the Fed does like to see this. All right. Income up three tenths, as I mentioned. Personal spending was flat on the month. It wasn't negative. There was some thought it might be, given the way we had seen declines in the overall uh, months of uh, February and uh, Jan January went up, February went down. Uh, personal spending was uh, only up one tenth the <clears throat> month before in March. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, real, real personal spending flat as well. Adjust for inflation, and you got nothing, no change. That was down two tenths in uh, February. The PCE deflators; these are the Fed's inflation numbers, month over month, up one tenth of a percent, and that puts us at zero point. Uh, uh, rather, the uh, year over year puts us at four point two percent. Core is up zero point three percent. The core deflator. Uh, up 4.6% on a year-over-year -year basis. Yeah. That's the same as the prior month, but a big drop in the year-over-year -year number from 5% to 4.2% base effects at work there. Uh, so we are seeing some improvement in the headline number, but of course we're still waiting. Well, and the revisions the that we're getting, yes. yeah, and the revisions that we're getting are upward revisions almost across the board with the exception of personal spending, uh, which makes sense given some of the concerns in February uh, around everything. I'm surprised there isn't more of a reaction in the bond market. We're not seeing much movement in terms of two-year yields, which are basically flat after uh, bouncing around a bit, still debt lower on the S&P and NASDAQ. But what I'm struck by is this seems to paint a picture of inflation not coming down nearly as quickly as people had previously expected. Is there anything to challenge that assumption? Nothing so far. I think what we're seeing is in the bond market is basically uh, people had already figured out what the Fed is going to do. They've got other things they're watching in terms of uh, the banking issues, et cetera. And so there's there's not a lot of new information in this that's going to change people's minds. We were up 1.2% for the employment cost index. The forecast was for 1.1%. So nothing that really tells you that we're seeing a huge inflation problem still there. Uh, wages right. still going up, but not a huge problem. Michael McKee, thank you so much on this raft of data. Michigan data at 10 o'clock uh, as well. Right now, Neela Richardson to sort this out for us with a wonderful purview from ADP, Automatic Data Processing. She is the chief economist for the company that does so many paychecks from C to Shining C. Neela, I look at this, and I'm sorry, as I said this morning, I've shifted from a May analysis to a Fed meeting June, Fed meeting July analysis. Analysis. I don't see inflation coming down in these statistics. Do you? We've seen a little bit of deceleration in payroll wages, and I think that's important to keep an eye on because we know that inflation has morphed. It started as a supply shock reaction. Now it's in the service sector, and that's what we're watching in terms of overall compensation. So, yeah, we're seeing some deceleration. We, we didn't see quite that deceleration in the ECI uh, that was reported, but we're seeing it in the payroll data. Uh, we have about 25 million workers that we're keeping track of, and after a three-month plateau in March, we saw a deceleration. So when we release next week, we're going to be looking to see if that deceleration in wage growth continues. What's the pace of the deceleration? Does it feel like it's uh, accelerating or does it feel like it's just this tick by tick lower just simply because year over year comps are difficult? 
Well, we're able to do year-over-year -year comps really rigorously because of the scale of the ADP data. We can match individual workers who stay on the job and individual workers who actually leave their job. So those compositional effects aren't in the ADP payroll insights data that we provide, and that gives us a really clear lens on what's going on with pay. And what we're seeing is that we saw a, a decline last month that was significant if you look at the past year. Wages and pay peaked in May of last year. Leisure and hospitality peaked in June. So leisure and hospitality, or low-wage uh, pay overall, have been driving these gains, and we're finally seeing a notable decline. But that being said, uh, full context, it's still much higher than before the pandemic in terms of pay growth. Are you getting the sense, Neela, that the shift in labor, labor markets is moving much more quickly than people appreciate in terms of how much things really are loosening up and really jobs are getting eliminated? You know, I know that's what the headlines say. And we see, I, I've seen like five or six headlines this morning uh, before I, I, my morning coffee. But when you look at the data, when you look at the initial jobless claims data, you see that proxy of layoffs still well in line with where we were before the pandemic. And when we talk to firms, even smaller firms that should be more vulnerable to, to the interest rate uh, hikes that we've seen so far, they're still trying to hire. They're still trying to find people. So, you know, I regard the labor market as an area of strength for the economy. It's a challenge because it's usually the mechanism in which you bring down inflation. But keeping people employed is what's supporting the spending we saw in the first mm -hmm. quarter numbers. Mila, not to give away the family jewels, but I'm going to be rude and ask anyways. It's Rude <laughs> Friday. And that is across the American deciles of how we're compensated, how correlated are we in our monthly dynamics of an ADP paycheck or is there huge discreteness across deciles in the wage dynamic? Let me try answering that question, Tom, and you'll, you'll let me tell. You tell me if this is what you're getting at. You know, where we've seen the highest and fastest wage growth is in that lowest decile. That's what took off after the pandemic because those were the jobs, those consumer facing, lower paid jobs that were decimated by the pandemic. And then companies scrambled to get workers back, and those skills were fungible. They could move throughout the economy, they could go into restaurants, they could go into warehouses. And so there was a big scramble to get these workers. Mm -hmm. back, and that scramble was matched by really high wage growth. You're not seeing that at the top end. In fact, one of the industries that we've seen the most significant deceleration is in information services. That was a, a sector that wasn't really hit hard during the pandemic. It actually grew right. during the pandemic economy, and we're seeing some softness now, um, and that softness is reflected in pay gains. And, and Lisa, to me, what's so important here is the thinking late April into May of the theme we're hearing from some guests, not all guests, that it is high wage types that are seeing the agony. I mean, the Lazard announcement this morning is, is small, but you wonder what the upper deciles dynamic is going to be into the summer. The white collar uh, yeah. sort of layoff or recession kind of feel rather than what normally is felt initially. And Neela, this speaks to what you're seeing in the fundamentals. And you said the labor economy is still strong, even though you are seeing some sort of deceleration in the pace of wage gains. And if you keep people employed, they keep spending and consumer spending will keep this economy chugging along. Given that and given what we just got, is there a chance of recession on the horizon this year, or is it off the table as far as you're concerned? Nothing's off the table, Lisa. <laughs> but yes, there is a chance of recession, and we'll have to kind of watch the incoming data. There's also a chance that we skid through it, that we do not receive a recession, that we have this instance of slower growth. Now, that being said, um, I think we've been lulled to sleep by the past 10 years of economic expansion before the pandemic. Recessions generally happen in the econ economy every three to four years. Recessions come and go, but what tends to stick is really slow growth. Ask our friends in Japan. So what we don't want to have uh, in terms of our scenario analysis is an economy that's stuck in a plateau or very slow growth when inflation is still uncomfortably high. 
Neela, thanks so much. Neela Richardson with us with ADP as we look at the economic data. And I really want to emphasize the importance of Michigan data here at the 10 a.m. hour. There's some sub-data before that. But at 10 a.m., and at least I'm really interested in the 5- to 10-year inflation look um, as as well. Lisa, I want to get out front of our next conversation because you and I have talked about this, and John's talked about it, but I don't think – it's been something in the national zeitgeist yet. Just one headline, this from Bloomberg. Thank you, Cranes, for picking up Bloomberg on this. New York still has the priciest rents, but Jersey City, far to the west, is closing in. And it's the rent dynamic, residential and commercial, and the commercial restructuring dynamic now. And I wonder if that's the great unspoken for the rest of the year. Can you convert office space into residential, is, right? I mean, well, this is basically yeah, the fundamental year. underlying yeah. uh, sort of question. But <clears throat> on a bigger scale, at what point is the weakness that we have seen in the office market spread into what we have seen in some of the residential areas? Or is this sort of a specific, I hate to use it, but I'm going to use it, idiosyncratic moment based on the work from home uh, trends, et cetera. But we're going to have a fantastic conversation conversation coming up with Bob Solentic, uh, head of CBRE, exactly on this topic. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking right now, I'm doing the math here on the Bloomberg. You got 42000 make it $43,000 of average rent in New York every year. Divided by three, you got to have $120,000, $130,000 income on a median rent in Manhattan. And that's the residential side let alone the commercial side. This is, for many of you on Global Wall Street, our conversation of the day coming up. Robert Salentic joins us. CBRE President, Chief Executive Officer, Futures, negative 15, the VIX 17.10. We'll give you a First Republic brief next. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with the news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Speaker Kevin McCarthy is putting the pressure on President Biden and Democrats to embrace his plan that was passed on the House floor in order to avoid a debt limit crisis. In an interview with Bloomberg TV, he said the president is putting the economy at risk by avoiding a negotiation. Biden opposes the measure because it includes sweeping spending cuts in order to raise the debt ceiling. Meanwhile, President Biden and congressional Democrats plan to attack Republicans' proposals to slash Social Security and Medicare. They see it as a key wedge issue in the 2024 election campaign. The thinking is that the message can win over seniors, working class voters, independents and suburban women. Mercedes-Benz says its order backlog will support sales in the coming months, despite the subdued global economy. The luxury car maker sees demand in Europe falling, but it expects to do well in two of its biggest markets. Demand in, in the U.S. Uh, is uh, really good, is solid. Uh, and uh, now, I mean, in particular towards, I mean, the, the tail end of the quarter one, we could uh, see the demand, I mean, uh, coming up and coming back up again in, in China. Mercedes has been focusing on selling more of its higher-end cars to boost its profit margins. Deutsche Bank has agreed to buy British boutique Numis in an all-cash deal that could reshape investment banking in the city of London. The deal values Numis at $512 million. That's a 72% premium to Thursday's close. The transaction will give Deutsche Bank one of the biggest teams of bankers in London. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. Stagflation by far. That, that is the worst case scenario. There is a lot of assumption out there that inflation is going to keep coming down. That is the consensus forecast and there's very, very little dispersion in those expectations. So inflation, if it were to reignite and start moving up, that takes away everything which is underpinning the market today. Seema Shah, principal group, with a huge response today to her thoughts on the markets and on the state and differences across the transatlantic divide from her London School of Economics at to hear. She really made quite a splash, and so much of it was just backed up by this informed view on the markets, the uncertainty. The difficulty in gaming out an economy that has defied all projections of collapse over the past year. We're going to get right to it right now because this conversation is too, too, too uh, important. Lisa Bramwitz and Tom Kane, Mr. Farrell, waiting with Dr. Olarian for the next hour's festivities. 
And with us, and this is really important, is Robert Salentic. He's president and chief executive officer at CBRE. Who is CBRE? What you need to know is if you're a computer guy out of Ames, Iowa, and you get a job in Texas in real estate, over a number of years, maybe it prepares you for the great financial crisis of 2007, 2009. Bob Solantic has been on the watch at CBR3, uh, CBRE, I should say, through now not one, but two crises. And he joins us in our studios this morning. Thank you, and th thank you so much for joining Bloomberg uh, thank this you, morning. Thank you, Tom. Good to be you here. You, more than anybody I know, push against the stereotype of real estate investment trusts. OMG, we're all going to die. The stocks have cratered. Your stock is down, but you've got a 12% total return over the last 12 years. CBRE is the outlier. What is your best practice removed from the volatility train wreck of REITs? The best practice in the regard you're talking about, Tom, is that we are very diversified. We're diversified across asset type, diversified across service type, diversified across geography and diversified across client type. And we're very substantial across all four of those dimensions. So mm -hmm. as things ebb and flow, as right. secular trends emerge, we can push resources into the areas that are favored, as we've done over the last few years by pushing resources into multifamily and pushing resources into warehouses and pushing resources right. into outsourcing and project management, and that's worked very well Nick for us. Nick Bloom is leading the academics on work from home out at Stanford. It's, you know, we all know it's sort of grim and life-changing and all that. That part of CBRE that is in the cliche of Midtown Manhattan, sea to shining sea, that's empty. Is that going to is that going to continue? Is is this legitimate emptiness that we see now? It's it's a legitimate um, backing off of the amount of office space that'll be used. But there's some important trends that are contrary to that. So, for instance, companies in general, and certainly here in New York, there's some famous examples here in New York of leaders that want to get their people back in. Well, the way you get your people back into the office is you create great environments in that office space. And so what you see across New York for the past several quarters, even though office leasing is down, and in the first quarter it was down by about a third year over yeah. year, we are running ahead of pre-pandemic levels as it relates to right. high-priced office leases because people want to be in those best buildings. I got a brilliant idea. CBRE takes over the Lincoln Tunnel. That'll <laughs> fix Midtown Manhattan. Well, yes, perhaps we'll have a fancy Lincoln Tunnel. This is the issue, though. You have dead office space that isn't retrograde, that isn't retrofitted for the sort of fancy experience. What happens to that? Are there just basically no-man lands of old office space that no one wants? Well, Lisa, we'd love to have an answer for everything, uh, but we don't. And one of the one of the quandaries we're faced with as an industry is there are going to be some antiquated office buildings, and it hasn't been figured out yet what's going to happen. You know, there's a lot of talk about can you convert them uh, to multifamily residential. Some of you can't. Some of them you can. Ironically, the ones that are most able to do that are the older, smaller floor plate buildings. Some of the ones that were built in the 70s and 80s with the very large floor plates and a small amount of elevators relative to the um, floor plates, et cetera. It's just not practical to convert them into residential. So we'll have to see what happens with there's those. A, there's a larger question here, especially as we're on the precipice of some change in the economic cycle. We don't know when, we don't know what, uh, but it seems as though there has to be a right sizing with housing prices that have remained resilient and rents that have come down with an economy that is stagnating in certain areas, and even with commercial rents staying relatively elevated, which is going to give? Are valuations going to fall more in the property, or are rents going to fall? Uh, I don't think you're going to see – you're talking uh, multifamily right. residential. Most of that, yeah. yeah. I don't think rents are going to fall a lot in multifamily residential, and the simple reason for it is even though you have – uh, interest rate issues, et cetera. Demand supply is still very real in that product type like it is in most product types. And the fact of the matter is you still have slightly less than average historical vacancy rates in multifamily residential. And mm -hmm. those high interest rates are causing single-family homes to be more expensive, which is pushing right. people into multifamily rental uh, properties. So I don't think you're going to see a big decline in rental rates at all. I got eight ways to go here. I could go to Miami. I could go to Europe and, you know, talk about what you're doing in Los Angeles or, frankly, boom southern economies where everybody from New York's moving to, including here at Texas as well. Forget about it. Let's go to the Pacific Rim 
in China. CBRE has a prism on Asia like no one. Do you buy the idea that the West can continue to work with China and that they'll see stability in their property market, which is the mother of all volatile markets? Well, I was, I was in Asia, in Hong Kong, about three weeks ago. And like so many things, Tom, the news, the uh, sensationalism around the political challenges. What's the reality there? That you the see? reality there is that we're doing a lot of business in China, and our business in China is growing. And there's a lot of business being done between the U.S. and China and a lot of effort okay. to get U.S. companies in there. There is political risk for sure. But, there, right. but th that, those are the largest – cities in the world or some of the largest cities in the world. And one of the things that's happening as it relates mm -hmm. to commercial real estate is intermediation, which we've had here and in Western Europe and in parts of Asia forever, but not so right. much in China, is becoming more and more prominent there. So we, we expect to grow our business substantially. Before we let you go, and unfortunately it is too short, I do want to just get your view on what the pricing impact is going to be of some of these regional banks with pretty big portfolios of loans that, rec that, uh, that back commercial real estate. What is the likelihood of some forced sales that really bring down prices in the yeah. near term? There's going to be some forced sales, Lisa, but here's, here's something that it just gets missed. Um, if you look at commercial banks' uh, assets uh, across the United States, Less than one and a half percent is in office buildings, is in office building loans. So, yeah, there could be there, there is some pressure now with less capital available, less debt available from commercial banks for office building is being backfilled by other sources of capital, um, private sources of capital, um, debt funds, et cetera, uh, the, the GSEs. Um, there is going to be down pressure. There is going to be some trouble as it relates to the to the regional banks, but it is certainly not huge in a way that would be ruinous for the uh, commercial bank industry. What about other sectors within the real estate? Are there other areas that are more exposed based on the concentration of these banks? Yeah. Fundamentals are really good in other areas. And when I talk about fundamentals, occupancy rates and rental rates, so just to give you a few, industrial, 3%, 3.5% vacant. Institutional quality multifamily, less than 5% vacant. Retail rents right. are on their way up around the U.S. Hotels doing very well. So the fundamentals in things other than office are actually quite good right now. I'm sure both of you have had experiences trying to get into restaurants lately. I mean, oh, no. It, it's, uh, no. I don't have a life. Lisa yeah. has a life. Pharaoh has a life. I don't yeah. have a life. So, so again, headlines um, are, are, are partially accurate. Anecdotally you, accurate, but not holistic. Do you really Solentech just he just shows up at any restaurant across the country oh, and it's just like, oh, Bob, yeah, absolutely. Bob, please, <laughs> please, did you get the check? Bob Solentech. As long you. as it's fast food. <laughs> Bob Solentech, thank you so much with C B R E, a real estate update. That's what we like folks, people with real uh, depth of knowledge on this. Lisa April, gone. Yeah, and not much clearer to, uh, to to save for. I mean, honestly, this is the issue, is that we don't leave April with more clarity for May other than, <clears throat> yeah, it's a soup. It just doesn't look as bad as a lot of people were expecting. Yeah, we'll drive to May, and, of course, a week next week that will be extraordinary. Apple has a certain mystery to it now after what we saw this week in big tech. And, of course, we'll have special coverage. The Fed meeting here will be really something our team's putting together uh, I think a, a, a very interesting show on that as well. Usually the Federal Reserve quietly led by the Bank of Canada announcements. We will not be quiet. At 1 p.m. this afternoon, our David Weston in conversation with the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau. Weston in Trudeau on the future of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Stay with us on radio and television. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Futures at negative nine.